Hey everybody, it's uh, Wednesday around 7 o'clock Central and I'm Matt Dillahunty and so welcome to The Hang Up. Here's what's going on. Uh, quick announcements for me and then some announcements for the channel. Uh, I'm going to be headed to Florida this weekend for the uh, Center Florida Free Thought Community. I'll be giving a talk uh, on Sunday, doing a meet and greet on Saturday. The talk's going to be, can you hang up on family? And so it's going to be a little bit about uh, dealing with um, the differences, I suppose, between debating people on shows like this and engaging with family, which, curiously, I'm going to see my dad for the first time in a couple of years next Wednesday. So looking forward to that. Uh, I'll be so Florida this weekend. Next weekend, I will be in Dallas uh, on Saturday for DebateCon 3. I'll only be there for the short period of time uh, on Saturday as I have other things going on, including the snake stuff. And yes, we do not have any eggs yet, but there are several that should be giving eggs any day. So we're, we're checking them about three, four times a day now for eggs. We've got some more pairings going on and all that stuff. And there'll be another special guest on a little later today, uh, a representative from the Secular Student Alliance, because on June 16th through June 18th, in St. Louis, Missouri, I will be at the Secular Student Alliance National Convention. Uh, I'll be doing my uh, Magic and Skepticism show, taking questions about skepticism, and doing a workshop on debating, both for those people who have an interest in doing more formal structured debates and for people who just want to be able to engage and have those uh, conversations and make them a little bit more productive. But today, let me tell you what's going on here at the line, because not only is, is the line going gangbusters, but uh, and are we branching out to the line X for some additional content? There are so many different shows and events in the works, including uh, in 2024, April 8th, there will be a total eclipse of the sun, which will be distinctly visible, visible from the hill country just north of Austin. And so we're using that as the opportunity to get as many people as possible to come down to Austin, hang out with people involved with the line, have a little kind of convention slash gathering um, for that event. But coming up this week on the Transatlantic Call-In Show tomorrow, it's Arden and Katie. So the OG Tech is, uh, hosts will be here again tomorrow. Uh, Jimmy's going to do a Because I Wanna on, is it Friday, I think? Because it doesn't have, yes. whenever the hell he wants. That's what Because I Wanna is. Uh, on the Sunday show, it's Jimmy and Forrest Valkai will be filling in because I will be in Florida. Monday, Skep Talk will be Aaron Ra and Brian Dalton. And on Tuesday, it'll be uh, Jimmy and uh, Seth Andrews talking about his ghost story book. But the big thing, there's lots of, there's so much stuff to be excited about. I'm working on uh, a debate show that is different from some of the others. I'll happily talk about the format for that probably next week we may be kicking that off by the end of the month and so if you're a theist if you're someone who's called into the show and you have found yourself a little frustrated with the conversation if you're someone who isn't interested in doing a big you know 90 minute to two hour structured formal debate but you're also irritated that when you call into one of the call-in shows you don't get to talk as much as you want or you get put on hold or you get interrupted for clarification, or that we're just mean, or whatever your issue is, um, there's going to be an option coming up uh, in, in a couple of different ways for you to engage in short debates that are structured more than a standard phone call to one of the shows would be, but not so long and cumbersome as you might find in one of the debates that I do in public or at DebateCon or at... Um, uh, on modern day debates or whatever else. But of all those things that I'm excited about, number one is on May 16th, right here on the line, Dave Warnock will be launching his Dying Out Loud show as part of our network. And Dave is here tonight. How you doing, Dave? I only see, oh, there it is. Dave's sliding in now yeah, and is muted for me. Yeah. Am I? Wait, can you not hear no, me? I can hear you now. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm excited about that. I, uh, Jimmy and I have been talking about it with Arden. We had a meeting the other night, and I think, uh, you know, I've been talking about dying out loud stuff for four years now, and I always get a ton of questions about death, what's after death, are you afraid of dying, what's, you know, all these questions and conversations around the subject, and I want to hear from theists who... I want us to have conversations with theists who have 
ideas about what comes after death and also the right to die, you know, death with dignity laws and medical assistance in dying, where theists think that's um, playing God to do anything like that for someone like myself who's terminally ill. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to whatever those conversations end up end up being like. So excited to be a part of the line. Yeah, we're excited to have you here. I, I just want to say for the theists out there, um, I'll make you a deal for tonight because I, I love doing shows with Dave. We're, put, we're, we're moving forward. We want to be able to get people to call in, including theists, to give their perspective on dying out loud. And so normally if someone were to call in and talk about what they think happens after we die, um, I'm, I would ask them, you know, we, it would turn into a little miniature debate about how do you know any of that? How can you demonstrate that? Why, why do you believe that over something else? Mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll make you guys a deal tonight specifically for theists, for those people who think there is some sort of afterlife, that if you call in and clearly tell what you think happens after we die and briefly why you think that is, I won't try to get you into a protracted debate and ask for all of your evidence and everything else. I, I still will ask things like, you know, how do you know that? Why would you believe that? Does that make sense for somebody to believe? But it's not going to be in the, you know, once you say, hey, I think we go to heaven, and the reason is because the Bible says so. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, I, I'm just curious as to, from the standpoint, particularly of theists, um, what they think about death and dying, how they're dealing with it, because they think those kinds of conversations can wind up being useful in either helping some people get out of religion, but if it turns out they have good reason to believe this, or if this is just something that's comforting for them, um, that helps them parse out death, um, I think there's some value in it, at least having those conversations. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, I, I'm all, all about that. I mean, like you said, there's it's hard for... I, obviously, it's hard for any of us to provide evidence for what happens after we die, because nobody has done that. I mean, contrary to what the Bible says, but n nobody has come back from the other side and, and, and to let us know, well, here's what's, what's going to happen. Here's what's over there. So it's all just speculation. And so anybody who comes with proof is, is going to have a hard time del delivering that. Um, the, other, the other stuff we're going to talk about We've launched our. Uh, we've talked about this before. We've launched our five hundred five hundred one c three nonprofit. The other conversations we're going to have, in light of that nonprofit, because a big part of, of what we're doing there is advocating against the unwanted religious overreach in the areas of healthcare, wherein people go to the hospital or they're there with their dying relative and, and zealous nurses or doctors come in to pray for them or to send chaplains in where they don't want them. Um, we, have exp we have example after example of this kind of thing happening. I shared at the uh, American Atheist Conference last weekend, I got to speak at the awards dinner. And um, afterwards, I had so many people come up to me afterwards and tell me what their experiences were in that arena where they had people proselytizing them at their mom's deathbed, uh, when they were in the hospital seriously ill. That's not okay. And, and a big part of what we're gonna be doing is hearing from people like that and teaching people, helping people advocate for themselves in their own healthcare positions so that they don't have to put up with that sort of thing. Religion, as we know, preys on people when they're most vulnerable. As kids or college students, there's, there's hardly anywhere you're, where you're more vulnerable than if you're seriously ill or if you're dying. And they know that people are vulnerable in those positions. And so they come in and attempt to influence them at the last hour. And we're gonna we're gonna be pushing back against that as an organization in a large in a big way. So that awesome. we'll, we'll be talk we'll be talking about that on the channel too. Well, um so we had we had full lines, but we always like to keep lines open for theistic callers, and we had lines full of atheists. And there's a two-stage conversation thing because I can't talk directly to the screener, 
So I was giving uh, passing oh. messages to Jimmy to give to the screener about which calls to drop. And they dropped one of the calls that I definitely did not want to drop right off the bat. Um, Give it a call back. But you could potentially call back. But it was a it was a quick thing because they were asking, evidently after Perfect Dawa's call to uh, the Sunday show, he went and did a video like Crazy Matt Delundi or whatever else. Um, and somebody was asking a, a question about that. And just like to point out that that's exactly the type of person who can apply and potentially be accepted, both I mean, the not the caller, but Perfect Dawa, potentially be accepted for the in-boss debate show uh, that we're going to be launching, because it's the process for the show. And I haven't done the whole format, but it's it's basically going to be um, where someone instead of t two people presenting their case, you show up on the show to present your case. And you will be essentially grilled with questions mm -hmm. by the end boss for whatever subject that is. Uh, and the, the, the end boss is the one who's going to have control of the time for questions. So that if I ask you, hey, does this mean X? And you, you could just answer yes or no, uh, but you could be giving whatever answer you want and if I feel, or whoever the inbox is, feels that you're not um, answering the actual question, but are answering some other question or delaying, they get to interrupt and get you back on target. Um, and it's it's because, in part, there's a lot of frustration. It, there was a lot of frustration that called Perfect Dawa on Sunday, where I was like, "How do you know it's God? How do you know it's God? How do you?" And there wasn't anything that even began to be a recognition of what the question was um, that we'd like to see answered. So. You just know, Matt, because you know in your knower. That's what we used to say as Christians. You just know in your knower. Yep. Uh, I know that I know that I know that I know. That's what we said. <laughs> uh, before we move on, uh, just to let people know that the, the nonprofit is up and running. The website is live. We scrambled last week to get it up before the before the conference. Awesome. And it's IamDyingOutloud.org. If you want to support us, we'd love it. Go there, make a donation. It's tax deductible, all those things. So I wanted to throw that out there. Thank you for letting me do that, by the way. Of course. All right. I tell you what, since we already have calls and everything else, let's just start cranking through calls. Let's go. Let's um, go. Let's go. <laughs> I, the, the first two are going to be somewhat uh, similar. So is it Jamon in Missouri? Pronouns are he, him? Yes, sir. How's it going? Is is it pronounced Jamon? Yeah, uh, Jimon. Uh, yeah, Jimon. Okay, well, I want to make sure I say it right. So, Jimon, welcome to the show. You're on the hang up on the line. How's it going? How's it, uh, hello, Dave. How's it going? Hey, Jimon. Hey. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I just had a question. Just I have started working with um, at a warehouse. Essentially, I'm in between jobs, so I have this kind of temporarily. And my boss over top of me, he's a really good guy. I mean, good, smart dude. Seems like like he, I haven't had any any issues with him, but he's really far on the right. Like he has some really crazy ideas just about the world. I mean, just typical right wing conspiracy theory stuff. Um, and so we, we we discuss, and I'm I'm a skeptic, and I try to apply that whenever um, we talk and stuff. So I just ask him different questions. He brings up different you know, different conspiracy theories. And I ask him, you know, the, of course, how do you know that? Where do you, where do you get this information from? But the conversation often gets to a point where he's bringing up facts that like, or maybe they're not even facts that like I maybe have never heard of before. And then he wants to like base the conversation or argument solely around that. So I'm just having trouble um, kind of like reacting to that or just the best ways of, I mean, cause obviously I can't, I don't want to shut the conversation down just because I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm just, yeah, trying to find the best way to go about responding to those kind of um, claims. Well, hmm. all I know is that if somebody brings up stuff that I don't know anything about, I just tell them that. Yeah, I mean, I do, but then he, then it'll fit into, oh, you're just not aware, or you're only listening to, you know, what the left is feeding you or what certain types of people are. I'm like, no, like I listen to both sides, but there's just something i'm not an encyclopedia so i don't know everything so i mean i'll tell him that but then he'll try to spin into like oh you're just not 
you're not aware you're living in a different reality or just all that kind of well ask him for his sources i mean if he tells you something is is real or something happened he should have a source for that right other than he saw it on the uh, other than he saw it on youtube or saw it on the internet i mean there should be i know it's hard to know what's facts anymore because of different news sources we have to get our information from somewhere um but there should be a, a reliable source that he could show you that both of you could agree that is it is it a, a legitimate source or not if he just saw it or heard it on newsmax or even on fox news i'm gonna not find that really credible at this point oh yeah i mean that's yeah. what i'm guessing a lot of the information is coming but i i obviously can't say of course like we were discussing um gun bans and what types of weapons should and shouldn't be banned he's ex-military so i mean he's kind of on the fence that like i mean i asked him straight up like because i tried to find the line that where would you want to where would you want to ban these guns which guns would you want banned so i asked him should a shoulder mounted rpg be illegal and he said yeah i mean he basically said yeah everybody legally should have one and so there really is no line with this person and so he um later on in the conversation he brings up the 1994 assault weapons ban he's like we've tried banning assault rifles before nothing's happened from it and that was like i have never heard of that before and so that was like i don't know he spun the fact that i didn't know about it into the fact that like he was winning the argument essentially that like i'm not aware of this type of stuff and i don't really know what i'm talking about and this stuff like that so it's kind of frustrating i'm just trying to find well, different ways to i mean what's what's your goal i mean you're at work you're in a you're in a discussion with your boss and i don't know exactly what you do but i've been in those mm-hmm. positions before my boss is usually the last person that i want to argue with about politics and stuff that's not related specifically to the job um in the past when i when i had bosses like that um mm-hmm. it, you know I, I don't know at what point you could potentially put your your job or your working relationship at risk i don't tend to have when i had when i had regular jobs i didn't tend to have arguments and discussions like that with the people that I work with. But if yeah. the goal is for you to change his mind, then if he's bringing up data and, and points that y- you don't have a lot of information on, I would say the best thing to do is to say, Hey, that's interesting. Can you point me t- to where you got that information so I can look into it more and then look into it and then carry on the conversation a different time. It's not like, it's not like it all has to be sorted out in one sitting. Mm-hmm. Um, with, you know, if you, if you start asking for the information, you can look at it and you can also find other sources and you can be like, Hey, that thing you, you showed me the other day. Um, I, I think that that's actually, you know, correct. Um, but I also found this other source that competes with it. How do we know which one of those is <clears throat> more accurate or how do mm-hmm. we, you know, in, in arguing with statistics and making bad use of statistics, um, in his case, and he, he's saying that everybody should be allowed to have a rocket-mounted or shoulder-mounted Literally, rocket, yeah. rocket yeah, I, build I, grenade. I tried to find the line, yeah, where he would want certain guns banned, but he literally doesn't have one. He basically, yeah, everybody should have one, which blew my mind. I never heard anybody say that before. Yeah, well, I, I've heard and, people and, and say it, that. Yeah, it made you be a, <laughs> I mean, people like that, I have a brother, brother-in-law and sister who just, they can't get enough guns. And they live in Texas, of course, <laughs> but th- there's no line for them, like you said. And I, I think the problem, the, 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 the sad thing is with people like that, it doesn't matter what the facts are. You, you can show them that we have more deaths per, per capita via guns. We can, you can show them that gun, gun deaths are the number one cause of death in children now. You can show them all these statistics that are un, un, unarguable. But it doesn't matter because they their identity is wed to this notion that they deserve to have these guns and they'll die on the hill of Second Amendment rights until one of their family members gets killed by a gun senselessly. And then maybe not even then. Just yeah. the price you yeah. pay the price you pay for freedom. Right, I've maybe heard for, that. So they, they, and, you should have, you should so, have a gun or something. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. If she'd had, had more guns, she, she wouldn't have died. So yeah. I, I, don't, I don't waste my time arguing with these people, to be honest with you. Because there's no argument that will convince them. It doesn't matter how many people die at the <laughs> at the hand of guns. It, they are stuck in this mindset. It's such a part of their identity now that you'll never yeah. you'll you'll 
pry it away from their cold, dead fingers, as they say. I think the so I think I a key let, question. Let yeah. I think a key, key question, when you're talking to someone who literally advocates that anyone and everyone should be allowed to have RPGs, is yep. what would change their mind? At what point would you be willing to limit or restrict an individual's right to have firearms? Does it matter? Is it everybody gets a rocket launcher forever? Um, what would need to happen before you're okay with limiting this? By the way, the federal government already has limits and restrictions on things like RPGs and automatic weapons and stuff like that. Um, they're not even part of the problem. And if he's advocating that what we need is not only more guns, but less restriction on guns so that people can have whatever they want, then to me, the question to ask is, what would change your mind? Because if what that person thinks would, is willing to say would change their mind is either something that you or I or somebody else would be able to produce data-wise, or they're going to wind up admitting that nothing would change their mind. And if that's the case, then you say, then I guess there's no sense in us arguing it because yeah. you're not going to change your mind and I'm only going to change my mind for good reason. And I'm never going to find, I think everybody should be able to do whatever they want, whenever they want, with no regulations. Uh, I'm, I'm just not going to find that compelling. Yeah. And I would just say to that person, you and I have different values. You and I find different things important. and not waste your time with that anymore yeah he he tries to present himself as a rational person and you know if, if you prove me wrong I'll, I'll change my stance but like that's not a yeah. rational person that's someone who's shifting the burden of proof yeah. if anybody oh, who's like pro prove, prove me wrong yeah. anybody who's like prove point. me wrong is essentially asserting that they're right until you prove them wrong and that's not the way rationality works mm-hmm We've had the whole burden of proof comment. I, I enjoy the conversation because I, I mean, I generally do with, like listen to other people's perspective. It doesn't, the conversation doesn't get hostile at all. I mean, it may a little bit, but we're like, we understand where like there's limits to the conversation. Don't put, yeah, we, we just have like a level of trust with each other. I mean, it's, he's a, he's a good guy, good, good guy, but his ideals and his ideas about the world are just so mashed up from, you know, different news sources that like, Maybe if he grew up in a different environment, he could be somebody else. like he could think more rationally or think more. I don't know, but it's just like I don't know. I enjoy the conversation, so I'll probably keep. keep well, if you're having fun with I, it, I, my job isn't at risk at all. I, my job's fine, so um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't have to worry about that. If you're enjoying it, and and your only goal is to have a conversation you enjoy while you're doing stuff, okay, fine. If you ever want to get any hope of changing his mind, you're going to have to ask. What would it take to change your mind? Either what evidence would I need to present that would show, is there evidence that could show that your your position is untenable or incorrect? Um, because this isn't like a, you know, if you say, I believe everyone should be allowed to have guns, prove me wrong. Well, there's no way to prove that wrong. That's no. like, I believe yeah. everyone should have access to, to ice cream, prove me wrong. Well, you could say, ah, but ice cream causes this problem. And they can just be, I don't care. I believe everybody should have right you know, to that. And and you have to back drill back down. What? To, what's that? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. My bad. I just, you, you have to drill down to either what would change your mind, what data or evidence would be presented to to change your position on this, or what event would have to occur to, to change your stance, and then deal with whether or not those are rational. You know, should should everybody have be able to walk around with Molotov cocktails ready to go? Um, what about hand grenades? What about Bomb. Um, TNT? Should I be able to to strap dynamite to my chest and walk around town, you know, with a detonator? I mean, you know, <laughs> is, is there no line? Um, you know, should I be able to get a Seawis mount off of a retired Navy vessel and put it? on a motion trigger on my backyard so that if anything walks in my my yard it just gets lit up with hundreds or thousands of rounds a second it's just yeah yeah you, you got to dig in on what would change your mind otherwise you know you're talking at stuff yeah 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 i 
yeah, I've seen the conversation go that way. So, okay. Well, I mean, I, I appreciate the, the help and the information. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'll keep having the conversation. Awesome. Thanks, Jimon. Thanks, Jimon. Appreciate the call. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Let's do this. Have a good evening. Oh, it, it's frustrating. There's, there's lots of topics that are like that. And, and you're, you're right in that some people are so entrenched in a particular ideology that uh, I'm not convinced that anything would change their mind. It's just that I don't know how to tell who those people are and, yeah. and how to tell which ones will change their mind until I ask them what would change your mind. And, and I know that it's, it's a particularly frustrating question for a lot of people. It, it never frustrates me when people call in and say, hey, what would change your mind on whether or not a God exists? Um, I, I tried a bunch of answers, and now I've come up with, I don't know. But that's okay, because God knows. And if, if God knows, then he's, he's either going to do it or he's not. And that's yeah. nothing I can do about that. And the answer is not nothing. We wouldn't say, well, nothing will change my mind, because that's, that's a, a locked-in position. I'm, I'm, of, I'm of the position that, yeah, you, you, there's probably something that will change my mind, but haven't seen it yet. I'm open yeah, to it. Yeah. It also, what would change your mind on a particular subject? is conditioned upon the specifics of that subject. What would change my mind about whether or not Jesus Christ exists and is God is different mm -hmm. from what would change my mind about whether or not the Quran is the inspired word of Allah, which is also different from whether or not I have good reason to believe that Scientology is true, which is also different from what, what, what would convince me of uh, Buddhistic ideas or anything else. The claims are different, even though they, they get lumped into the same category. And so you need to be very clear about what the specifics of these claims are so that you know, you don't have any shot of figuring out what would or should change your mind until you first define what you're actually talking about. And we, are, we humans are lazy about the language such that it's like, do you believe in God? Call in and explain. And a lot of times in those conversations, we don't even bother trying to get a definition of which God they're talking about or what the specific characteristics are or any of that. Because, and we end up talking past each other because the believer has a God concept and your God concept doesn't line up with that until mm -hmm. you actually define it. Right. Yeah. We have to know what we're talking about. I got a, I got a guest for, I got a guest with my guest. Dave's not a guest. Dave's family. Um, but I have a guest calling in, Matt from the Secular Student Alliance, uh, to talk about the National Convention coming up in St. Louis. Matt, welcome to the Hangup. Hey, Matt. Um, and hey, Dave. Um, I got the chance hey, to meet Dave just this past weekend in, uh, in Phoenix at the AA conference. Yeah. So great to talk to you both. Yeah, we had our tables back to back. We had, uh, we had a busy little table section between you guys and me and Seth and daryl ray at recovering from religion so we had a lot going on it was fun we sure did it's you know it's very hard being so popular i know right what are you gonna do <laughs> i know uh but yeah thanks for having me on man i'd love to talk about the secular student alliance conference yeah so so i guess get i'll, I'll rattle off uh some of the people they can expect to be seeing and speaking there um senator megan hunt um, some jackass named Matt Delaney, uh, Jasmine Banks, Andrew Hartzler, <laughs> Justice Horn, Elizabeth Reiner Platt, David Warnock. Oh, who the hell is that? Uh, Andrew Seidel, hooray. <laughs> Anthony Cruz Pantojos. Or Pantojos, sorry. Wow. Daryl Ray, Pantoja. Sarah Levin, uh, Jeff Blackwell, uh, Samantha McGuire, John Peters, uh, Kazi Habib, Rachel. Oh, boy. Hemelhawk, I think. Uh, Sharon Guy Hemel, Jones Hemel. and Shira, Shira Berkowitz. And I, for every other speaker whose name I butchered, feel free to butcher my last name and others um, and, and just call me whatever the hell you want because it's fair. Hey, I, I think it's cool you even made the attempt. I'm, I'm very impressed. Mm -hmm. so, so what all is going to be going on at the convention? What can people look forward to? I will go ahead and post the link in chat um, so that those who are interested can come over and is it open to just anybody or is this just for students tell us what's going on yeah good question so um this is absolutely open to everybody um, this is a conference uh that focuses on students but we want the whole 
uh, not just secular community, but we have activists um, from a bunch of different movements. We have elected officials coming. Um, and so this is really a, a, a conference for a wide swath of people. Um, and it's our first time back in three years. Um, you know, there were some things going on the last three years or so that made it hard to get together in person. Um, so it's, it's the first chance we really have a whole generation of students, like, you know, generations in college is four years. So we got a whole generation of students who never had a chance to go to this conference. Um, so that's why we're holding it, to find community with other secular students, um, to learn from each other, to learn from leaders in our community and in wider progressive movements. Um, there's really so many opportunities to grow here. Um, we also do have uh, travel assistance available. We can help you fundraise. Um, we can help you arrange your travel and that kind of thing. Uh, whether you're connected to an SSA chapter or not, like we want to help you get there. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, check out the link that Matt posted in the chat. And then also you can uh, email organizers. Uh, that's organizers at secularstudents.org and connect with us and we will help you get there. Awesome. Now, for those I mentioned at the, at the top of this, um, I think, is it Friday evening? There's a... Uh, dinner and my show. Uh, yes, actually, yeah. There, uh, you will be doing a magic show on Friday evening, um, and then also you'll be doing a workshop for us on uh, how to, how to be a better debater. Um, and so, and then Dave Ward, Dave's going to be there to talk about um, uh, both dying out loud and about how to have difficult conversations with uh, with your loved ones about um, about your secularism. Awesome. I've I've certainly had a lot of experience in that. <laughs> yeah, Matt, I, like I could that. be the I could be the dummy. You could I could be the theist in your practice today, and we could uh, we could try a debate, and I could be the because I used to be a theist, so I could trot out all those worn arguments. <laughs> if you're not doing anything at the time that I'm doing the debate workshop, you're more than welcome to come sit in my workshop with me and and talk about it from two perspectives. Because yeah. you and I do things a little bit differently, and yet mm -hmm. I don't. I well, don't know that you and I have ever I'll had a disagreement it. slash debate that didn't work out really well in fairly short order. Yeah, no, I've never been a debater. In fact, I, don't, I would never pretend to be a debater. Um, you, you are the master at that. But I could, I could certainly uh, lend my assistance to the, to the argument. But if I'm, I don't know what the schedule is. We'll see how it works out. But I'll be there for the whole weekend. So happy to help awesome. anywhere. So I'll make sure, I'll make sure not to schedule you both together, so you can make that happen. Okay. There you go. It's, it's yeah, nice yeah. having the people run stuff on um, while I'm spitballing ideas. Isn't, isn't that great? Yeah. And so, and also, just for the folks listening, I mean, this is your opportunity. You can meet Matt. You can meet Dave. <laughs> Um, a lot of the members of our community, um, folks that Matt has here on the show, you can actually meet them, talk to them. So it's, it's our chance to all meet each other in person, make a stronger secular movement. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for calling in, Matt. And, and we'll do it again, um, you know, when we get a little bit closer to the event, um, maybe touch base uh, late in May to, to do another reminder for people. We'll get the, the word out. And by then, I will know uh, I'll, I have a better understanding of everything that's going to happen with me that weekend because the Magic and Skepticism show is, you know, this the one that I toured with. Um, it's a hour and a half to slightly closer to two hours on occasion. Magic show that teaches skepticism and and then includes some Q and A uh, to cover those kind of topics. But mainly, it's an excuse because a lot of conventions can just be. Let me give you my lecture. Let me give you my lecture. Let me give you my lecture. Let me give you, and let me tell you, if there's one thing that um, college students need, it's another lecture. <laughs> and so it's much better if we break that up by saying, here's a fun way to maybe learn something um, and to just like let our minds have a bit of fun. I love doing magic for my entire life. And so I'm putting together a modified version of the show that I toured with before uh, so that it's easier to get there on an airplane uh, and yet still we'll have lots and lots of uh, magic and lessons for 
um, everybody. So I'm looking forward to it. Matt, thanks so much for calling in, and we'll touch base with you when we get closer to the convention. Thanks so much for having me. We'll talk soon. Right. Good to see you, Matt. So, yeah, you'll be there. I'll be there. Andrew Seidel will be there. Um, It'll be fun. It'll be yeah, fun. I'm, I'm always looking forward to that type of stuff. It's yeah. been ages since I've got to hang out at an SSA convention, and so I'm really looking forward to that. We had a theist caller, uh, and they yeah. dropped. Ah. Yeah. It, it's so frustrating. Um, Come on back. We don't yeah. bite. It was, and yeah. it was a theist caller calling to talk in about death and dying and uh, mm. dignity and dying. Right. Maybe he, uh, maybe they got uh, disconnected. Call back, please. Yeah, I'm going to take this call because it really has nothing to do with a good chunk of the show, and I don't want to turn um, the hang up into my snake channel. But there was a, a video I shared uh, just the other day, and uh, Caleb's on the line and is calling in about it. Welcome to the hang up, Caleb. How are you? Holy smokes, I'm great. Thanks for asking. I don't want to derail the show either. So I was expecting to be dropped, to be honest. <laughs> I'm happy to talk to you guys, though. Well, I so in, in full disclosure, I told them to drop you uh, because I figured you, you and I could talk about this another time. Um, I don't but they kept you. All, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm like, uh, what was it? Let me, let me tell everybody what happened briefly, and then you can add whatever you wanted to it, and then we'll just move on from there. Um, Florida Fish and Wildlife. The Florida laws regarding keeping reptiles are problematic and getting worse. Um, what reptiles you can or can't keep it, it is going to be different from state to state, and in some cases, even finer locations than that. And if you're outside the United States, um, you're going to have different laws as well. I know if you're in Canada, for example, you're allowed to have Fiji banded li lizards, but you can't have them anywhere in the United States. And it has more to do with a treaty than any sort of um, invasive species. At some point, I'll talk a little bit more about invasive species because in Florida, there's a problem with Burmese pythons in particular, which is not the result of uh, breeders or keepers being irresponsible. There was a hurricane that took out a breeding facility, and that was enough to start a population in the Everglades, and it's a legitimate problem. Um, that they're dealing with. And so they've made some more snakes illegal. The video that I shared was of Florida Fish and Wildlife going in to kill a bunch of snakes that this individual was no longer allowed to keep. The individual used to be legally allowed to keep them. They changed the laws. He rehomed as many of them as he could and asked for an extension in order to rehome the rest of them. That extension was not granted. They showed up specifically to kill um, a number of his snakes, but he also had snakes there in his facility, which were legal. And they discussed it ahead of time, and he marked and told them specifically which ones were pets that were perfectly legal that they shouldn't have been allowed to kill. But because the fish and wildlife people didn't know what the hell they were doing, um, unless this wasn't an accident, which is still in question, um, or were sloppy or whatever else, they ended up, in addition to killing the snakes that they were legally allowed to kill, they ended up killing a boa constrictor that he had had for 10 years, which was pregnant with tens of thousands of dollars worth mm. of babies. All completely, I mean, this was, he's, he's allowed to have it, he's allowed to breed it, this is all legit. They just killed his incredibly expensive pet and a good chunk of his livelihood. Um, we need we need better laws, first of all, and it's why one of the reasons why I'm supportive of of U.S. ARC, uh, the United States Association of Reptile Keepers, who are basically lobbying for us. But also, if we're not going to be able to fix some of those laws, we need fish and wildlife and whoever's going to be enforcing them to be properly trained so that they know the difference between a boa constrictor and a reticulated python. It's not that hard here, to tell here. the difference. Oh my God. Okay. So that's they the just, story. US ARC actually just released the uh, necropsy footage from that. It's on their YouTube channel. Um, so yeah. there were 32 rare phenotype 
um, fetuses. Trigger warning, by wow. the way, for anyone who watches that. It's tough to watch. It's a, mm. it's a gruesome video that um, I get it. A lot of people hate snakes and hate reptiles, and they don't understand. They don't they don't understand my hobby, and and I'm not you know I'm not going to turn this into uh, the snake show again today. Um, but it's a real deal. Imagine if you if you if I told that same story, and instead of snakes, they were dogs, and for whatever yep. reason, Florida had decided to outlaw rottweilers and german shepherds and this person had rottweilers german shepherds and labradors and and poodles and the game wardens or whoever's enforcing this not the game warden but the enforcement people showed up and they were supposed to kill all the rottweilers and all the german shepherds but in addition to that they killed a prize poodle pet how would you feel then i get it not everybody like snakes or whatever else but we're talking about rights we're talking about enforcement we're talking about people's pets and in some cases people's livelihoods it's it's an absolutely i hope they sue the shit out of the city um or the county uh, as the case may mm -hmm. be um i don't know if you had anything else to add on that caleb i'll i'll get a link to us arc i do well thank you very much i do actually since we're talking about death and dying Dave, I uh, didn't know who you are before the show, and I went to your website, and you are amazing, man. Really good on you. And Thank I'm you. curious to know what both of you think. Um, in the video, there's uh, Mr. Coffee owns the facility. The boa constrictor that was killed, the gravid boa, uh, was actually by one Mr. McAdam owned. Uh, but the facility was Mr. Coffee's, and you hear him in the video how distraught he is. Obviously, this is extremely traumatic and i hope he gets therapy and a good one with the money that he earns by suing the state or whoever um but how how do you recommend dealing with um, a traumatic event where you or a loved one or in this case a pet is denied a dignified death or a dignified process of dying and death is such a difficult subject for most of us. And um, when ourselves are facing a death like I am, and we're facing the possibility of not having the option of facing that with dignity and being forced to endure uh, endless, needless suffering. The same thing was with a pet. I mean, I've said this many times. Uh, in talking about this, that we treat our pets better than we treat our people in this country, because most of us, when a when a pet is suffering, we'll put it down out of compassion. But in this case, the pet, the snakes weren't suffering, and and this owner who was distraught and traumatized because of this needless slaughter that's that's a whole that's a whole another kind of trauma and and anxiety, and so. To your point that you mentioned, I hope he is able to get some therapy to work through that um, and deal with his loss. It's it's just loss is loss, whether it's the loss of a snake or a dog or a spouse or a parent. People that we things that we care about when we lose them, there there's pain involved and there's trauma. If that loss is in a way that's even more difficult than it should have been. I mean, we're all going to lose somebody and there's no pet or animal that we own that most likely is not going to be a loss at some point. And, but most of us get to do that in a way that's compassionate and timely and something that we can prepare for. But when it's taken away like that suddenly and needlessly and, and it, it causes a lot of pain and trauma. So, Hey, trauma is trauma. Like I said, and loss is loss. So I hope this guy can really get some some good therapy and deal with that in a way that's healthy. Yeah, it's difficult. Um, yeah, and just as just for the people who don't know, there's somebody in chat who I was just told by a moderator's not my biggest fan, and they've been trying to get him to call in, but he won't call in. Uh, who's repeatedly said you don't get to compare snakes to dogs? Yes, I fucking do. Um, you yeah, can compare and contrast to actually talk about the differences as well. But I already told you what you're not going to talk about in chat. So you can call in and put up or shut up because you're done in chat. 
I wonder if we treat snakes differently. I was thinking about that because you guys are, you know, you guys do snakes. I don't. But I wonder how much of our attitude about snakes is because of the, the biblical undergirding in this country or maybe the world, you know, with the Garden of Eden and the serpent being evil and all of that. I, I mean, we don't do that with lizards or any other kind of reptile, but snakes have this category of being evil. And, and like you said, like this guy says, you can't compare them with dogs. You sure as hell can. What difference? I mean, I don't, I've never had a snake as a pet, but I've had dogs, and I don't know. I've, I've seen your snakes matter, some of them. I don't see the difference. I, I see differences. I mean, I've had dogs. I love dogs. And you know, dogs are going to be more friendly and cuddlier to you. The snakes basically at most tolerate you. But w what the snake well, is. So do cats. A, cats nobody's saying true. you can't. I mean, cats are no more loving than a snake. Let's be honest. True. But what, what a snake is to you is separate from what <laughs> you are to a snake and what value people have from their pets. Um, yeah. Whether they're, no, but no matter what their pets are, yes, that includes insects and bugs. And the, these are both, you could view it as possessions, but probably it's more, better to view it as, as an act of stewardship where there are people who have, uh, who value and have a relationship with whatever pet they have. The fact that it's not the same as you and your pet is just, it's, it's just absolutely vile to shit on somebody else's pets or preferences as it is for somebody else's kinks or some, who somebody else loves or anything like that. You know, oh, as your favorite movie isn't my favorite movie, so your favorite movie is not legit. Well, if that person in the chat really felt like their argument had weight and merit, they would just call in. The fact that they're lurking in the chat shows us that they really don't don't have confidence yeah. in what they're saying. That's always what I've said. But so call I don't us. know if you have anything to add, Caleb, but I got to get moving on. So uh, last shot for it. Whoop. I guess he's gone. I guess so. Thanks, Thanks Caleb. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have no idea what you mean, Paul. But when, when you say stuff like, you're almost there or you're getting there. Um, it, it comes it off as, is uh, now I'm talking to chat again. It comes off as very condescending to, to tell somebody, Oh, yeah. you, you're almost there. You've almost, almost got there. it. And it's, yeah. That's like, so demeaning and arrogant. I see you getting, you're doing so much better. Yeah. Whatever. Jeez, fuck me. Here's a, uh, <laughs> yeah. Alex in California pronouns are he, him. Welcome to the line. You're on the hangup. Hey, Alex. I don't know. Do, something seems to be calling. wrong because the lines have emptied out and I can't uh -oh. hear the caller at all. Uh oh. So I'm going to, I'm going to ping Jimmy. Reboot the call. Well, I mean, I'm here. Nothing's changed though. Try taking Kyle. This just, just to be extra careful. Sure. We'll put Kyle on. Kyle in Florida, pronouns are he, him. Welcome to the hangup. Mm -mm. All right, yeah, I got to figure out why. Uh, Something's off. Something has indeed gone amok. Yep. There's, there's no new calls in the queue, and I can't hear anybody who's actually on. So while Jimmy's looking into that stuff, Dave. Yes. So... You were just at the American Atheist Convention, and you and I are going to be at a couple conventions coming up. I didn't get to go to the American Atheist Convention. What are you? What were you? What was your takeaway from it? How was your experience? And and what do you think the the general mood was of the people who were there? Uh, especially yeah. since we haven't had much opportunity to get together over the last few years because of the yeah <clears throat> the Backstreet well, Boys missed, reunion yeah. tour. You met, we you were missed. Um, it, uh, we saw each other at the American Atheist last year in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I know you, you, we got a chance to hang out there. I think it was very similar to that. It was um, a lot of, I, you know, these conferences, you and I both know, and I think you alluded to it about the one in St. Louis coming up with, at the SSA. It's, it's not just about hearing lectures or talks or speakers. There's good information there. It's really more about a community coming together and people right. seeing each other. Oftentimes, the only time they see each other all year. And it's just a, a chance for those of us who share 
a like-mindedness to be, to just hang out together. And we had a lot, a lot of that. Andrew Seidel was there and Seth and R and we had just, and other people that we all know. And it's just a good chance to just, just hang out and talk and laugh and catch up. And uh, so it was very similar to what we saw in Atlanta a year ago. And um, I love it. I, I think it's, um, it's just a, a good chance to reconnect with people that we care about. And so if you're listening and you have thought about going to a conference and you see uh, one on Matt's schedule or my schedule coming up, I'm going to be in Washington, D.C. next weekend at the Summit for Religious Freedom. Um, Americans United, uh, the group that Andrew Seidel works with, um, is putting that on. It's an inaugural. If you're in that area, come see us. I'm in uh, I'm in Denver first weekend of May at the American Humanist Conference. Come out and see us there. These are again, you can hear me talk online and not have to travel across the country or Matt. I mean, you can yeah. go to you you can go to YouTube and hear anything we have to say. I mean, I mean, but it's that community, it's that connection that we do this for. I mean, otherwise, stay home and stay in your pajamas and watch YouTube. But if you want to connect in person and rub shoulders and, and get to know someone on a, on a different level, then these conferences are great for that. So it was a great conference. I didn't know I was speaking until I got there. And then I, I got my badge and they said, Oh, you've got a workshop Saturday afternoon. And we want you to speak at the dinner Saturday night. Okay. <laughs> That's Which amazing. I was, thrilled, I was thrilled to do by the way. Yeah, it was fun. Well, give it a shot. The, the opportunity to uh, to get together and and hang out with like-minded people is especially valuable when there are people who I've heard from over the years who seem to always be convinced they're the only atheist within a million miles of them. Uh, nobody else is around, uh, so they don't have the opportunity um, to have fellowship. I, I don't know how yeah. many other different ways to somebody might Christian want to term. phrase it. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I mean, I don't, know. I don't know if we have our lines back, but I wanted to say this too. I ran into people at those conferences and I'm thinking of a couple in particular and one lady that stopped me at the, at the top of the escalator and just told me, thank you for what you do and mentioned you, Matt. Um, she said, uh, you, I've heard you on shows. I've heard Matt, you guys changed my life. You changed me. You let me know that I wasn't crazy. You helped me find the language to define what I was experiencing. And she was in tears, Matt. She was just like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, first time I've gotten a chance to come to something like this, to meet you guys in person. And it's just a huge thing for me personally to meet someone who, who has benefited from the things we do on shows like this. And Matt, you've been doing it for decades and i've run into people you know they talk they talk to me but they also mention you and seth and others who've done it so much longer yep. than me and they tell me over and over again how impactful and meaningful it was to find us online and so it always i never get tired of hearing that it always warms my heart yeah and i don't want to i don't want to disparage anybody else's reasons for going to a convention and certainly wouldn't want it wouldn't want to take away from people's talks but at the at the bigger conventions um there are a number of different types of people who find themselves at those convention uh, some of them are going because they want to hear every talk yeah they they're going to listen and take notes and this is maybe they don't spend as much time watching stuff on youtube or whatever else this is where they're going to get the meat of the ideas that they want to discuss and share with other people. There are others who come to the convention and go to some of the talks, but mostly it's there. Uh, they are there to interact with people. And so a good chunk of what happens at some of these conventions like American atheists doesn't happen in the ballroom where the lectures or dinners are talking doesn't happen in the side rooms. It happens at the bar. Um, uh, you know, in, in the hotel lobbies where people 
I, I know I've been to conventions where I've seen people who never went into the convention at all <laughs> yeah. and stayed yeah. in the hotel lobby, just interacting with the other convention goers for the entire weekend. There's a number yeah. of different ways to do these events and people get different things out of them. Mm -hmm. Yep. You're right about that. And there's plenty there for everyone, whatever, whatever way suits you, you knock, knock yourself out. On that note, we are back up with uh, calls and callers, so let's try this again. We've got Alex in California, pronouns are he, him. Welcome to the line. You're on the hang-up. Hey, it's great to talk to you, Matt and Dave. Can you hear me? Hey, Alex. Yes. I hear you fine, Alex. Thanks for That's your patience. Great. Yeah, so um, the first caller answered a lot of my questions, but let me just uh, – I'll pose my question, and maybe there's some other, more context to it. Um, basically – how do you know when to stop trying to change someone's mind? And um, to elaborate on that, I've been trying to like, I guess, um, figure out like what's the best argument I can get to destroy theism or to like prove to people that um, they aren't, they don't have a good reason to believe what they believe. And I've obviously had a hard time doing that. And I'm like, I'm trying to figure out like how much effort should I really be putting into this? Cause it's not, it doesn't seem worth the time to um, put so much effort into something that doesn't seem to be doing anything, you know? So I, first of all, Alex, you're, you're the only one that can determine how much time you're comfortable putting into something. Um, my, my only way to answer this is about looking at the person that you're having the conversation with. Um, if, if you start to feel that it's going nowhere, stop stick a pen in it and say, you know, let's, let's go off and think about stuff and get back together and continue this conversation at another time. If you're in a long, repeated, protracted conversation with somebody um, where the two of you don't agree and you find that you're just repeating yourself, it may be that you're not going to make any headway or any progress until you have some other conversation, like the ones about what would change your mind or, um, what what in the world would need to change to to make you think that you're wrong um you may need to have conversations about the burden of proof but at the end of the day there are people who are never going to change their mind and there are people who will under the right circumstances and you could line up a hundred people and i don't have any reliable way of telling you which ones of them will never change their mind i don't have any way of telling you which of them will change their mind after one conversation, two conversations, five conversations. Maybe you're not the person to change their mind, but something you said is something that they'll reflect on when Dave's talking to them or when I'm talking to them. And so it's if, if somebody's willing to have a conversation with you and you are not so you know too exhausted to do it and you want to do it, I don't see any reason not to. I mean, you know, that you can think that it's futile and you could be right. But if you're at the point where the person you're thinking you're talking to, you don't think there's any hope of them, of you changing their mind, then drop the, drop the subject. If, if you think it's hopeless yeah. from that point out, you're certainly not going to be well, doing much good. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking when you're saying, when you're saying that, Alex, I, I'm reflecting back on my own deconstruction, my own changes. No one changed my mind. No one convinced me of a different position. I changed my own mind. And, and I did that by in, uh, intake of information and thinking differently about things. Um, I, I wouldn't, I don't approach people with the idea that I'm going to change their mind. I approach them by offering the idea that perhaps can we just think about something differently? If I can get someone to think more critically about their position, Ask them, like, why do you believe what you believe? Like Matt said, what would cause you to change your mind? Uh, those kind of questions are not threatening. If you come at them trying to change their mind, their, their defenses are going to be up. But if your position is, well, here's something that I've thought about. Here's something that caused me to change my mind. Why do you think the way that you think? Those kind of questions are not going to put them as much on the defensive but if I approach a conversation from the standpoint of I'm going to change this person's mind or I'm going to crush their argument, I'm going to crush their position, 
then I'm probably going to be coming at them in a bit more of a confrontational tone than I need to, and it's probably not going to benefit me or them. But if I think back to my changes, that was from me in having a, a series of, of intake of information over a period of time that caused me to reflect on my position and caused me to change my mind. I can honestly say no individual person or individual book or individual show changed my mind. And I, I dare say most people I've, I've known didn't have that experience of a particular conversation where they went, oh, wow, you're right. I've been stupid to be a Christian. Thank you for helping me. It doesn't usually work that way. It's a process. Yeah. 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 Does that help, Alex? Yeah, that helps. Yeah, thank you. I think cool. um, one more note. Um, I think I've been coming at it from the angle of like a bit of um, angry atheist where I'm annoyed that I was duped into this and I want to help other people get out of it. And it's frustrating when they don't get out of it as um, like I did. But yeah, it's definitely. But you, but you didn't right away. Yeah. Most. <laughs> you didn't right away either, most likely. So, um, yeah. you know, uh, you, uh, you may be, I mean, it may be um, new for you. I mean, most of us go through a bit of an angry atheist stage. We don't want to land there. We don't want to stay there. But it's understandable to feel angry and duped when, when you know, we feel like we were tricked. But, but uh, uh, you know, you kind of need to move through that phase and adopt a more um, understanding tone because an angry atheist probably wouldn't have changed your mind back, back in the day. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, thank you both. Um, it's great to talk with you, especially you, Dave. Um, I'm not too familiar with your stuff, but I'll definitely check it out. Well, thanks. Yep. Glad you awesome. called, man. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate your time. We, in addition to the to the atheist callers, we do have a couple of theistic callers, and um, I don't know if they're calling in specifically to address what they think about dying, but we may be able to answer that um, along with other things. But Chad in Missouri, pronouns are him, uh, has an argument for the existence of God, I think. So welcome to the Hangup, Chad. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hey, Chad. Yeah, I'm uh, only a half ass theist, so... Uh, anyway, the argument is that I used to, I'm not religious, but I used to argue with Christians and, uh, they always say the earth is so perfect. It must be created by God. And, um, uh, I say back to them that because there's so many planets, trillions or however many planets out there. So we're just like winning the lottery pretty much. That's why we live on earth. Would you guys agree that? That's the same argument you would use? Mm, I would just say the earth is not quite perfect, so I don't know. But uh, Matt, I'm, I'm, you've probably never heard this argument before, have you, Matt? Well, <laughs> look, look at the trees. <laughs> the notion that the earth is perfect is not anything that is... <clears throat> I mean, me. I would have never presented or claimed that the earth was perfect while I was a believer, because first of all, the no. Bible doesn't say that it was perfect. God says... It was good, not that it was perfect. Right. I mean, but that's, I think what, that's not I think what you're argument, saying is yeah. that I think that, I think that what you're saying is that their argument is essentially the Earth is perfect for us, or it is right for right. us, for and so of all the potential planets, can. yes. Um, but th that's getting the argument exactly backwards. We are the type of life that evolved here on the planet, and any life that evolved on any planet would find that planet perfect for them, but it. It's, it's wrong to think that that planet was created for them rather than that they were created by the processes on that planet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, like ideas that, would that, not... that's like saying that hole in the ground is the perfect size for that amount of water that's in there. You know, that that's how that that's backwards. Right. Um, but what would you say? Like the universe is, just like a zoom dot argument out on a universal scale. So the universe is just happened to be the universal law just happened to be set up in a way that supports life. 
because if the gravity is a little bit stronger or a little bit weaker, then we wouldn't have be able to like consolidate into well, planets and well, sure there there are some some physical properties of the universe that if they were different the universe would not be able to produce life like us but that doesn't tell you what kind of life may or may not be able to exist but in other cases we could say that if if the universe changed enough um or had been different enough that no life would have formed in which case there's nobody sitting here talking about it or speculating about it and so you know the fact of the matter is the universe is what it is it's not realistic to say oh because we're here it must have been intentional because mm -hmm. it could just be this is the only possible way for a universe to to form with only these criteria because we only have one universe to explore and investigate we don't have a bunch of different universes that we can compare it to to figure out which ones um are more or less likely i i thought you it says here that you're a theist who was calling in with an argument for the existence of God. And it sounds like you're not a theist and don't have an argument for God. So I'm confused. Uh, I, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm still walking up to it. Uh, so based on those premises, I heard some like cosmology people, like physicists that when facing the same question that like if the uni universe just happened to the universal law just happened to be the way, so it supports life. The, those physicists, their answer is the multiverse theory. They're, they're, saying, they're pretty much saying the same thing I say about Earth. There are so many planets out there. They're saying the multiverse theory is very likely, so there are infinite universe out there. We just happen to be in the one that supports life. And Yeah, that's I'm, not I'm my understanding. So so first of all, the multiverse is speculative. There's no demonstration right, that it's yeah. possible. There's no demonstration that it's true. And there's no reason to appeal to it because maybe this is the only universe. Maybe there's many, but we don't know because we only have this one to investigate. Okay, but I mean, the cosmology, they, they think it's, one of the more plausible explanation for why we exist happen to exist in this universe that have the no 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 the the possibility of a multiverse is not an explanation for why we exist in this universe that's just false nor is it an explanation for god uh, and, and well, usually that I mean, means the particular god even, that someone wants to defend and even if um, even if the multiverse is possible, that doesn't tell you anything at all about whether or not a god is possible. Yeah, or your particular brand of god. And and usually people who make this argument are wanting to defend the particular god they believe in. So even if it um, can be proven, that uh, I don't some, believe some, like uh, okay, I don't believe God created the universe, but I believe that since there are infinite universe, I, I mean, I believe in multiverse theory, so. Since there are infinite universe right. with different properties, there can be some kind of deity exists in those universe. Why, why do you believe the multiverse? Are, are you, do you have some, I don't know, expertise? Yeah, like in... I said, no, no, no. I, it's just, I'm just using the same argument I use against the uh, Christians on the planet. I think there's so many planets that's why we exist on this one. I mean, it's it's the same same argument. I just zoom it out to the universal level. It's not like yeah. A, I'm a sorry. Not a, it's a it's a poor argument before you zoom it out to a level that that is. We know for a fact there are many different planets, and that some planets would support life and some wouldn't. We don't know for a fact that there are any other universes. Your argument fails in its initial form, and it definitely fails when you expand it to the imaginary. Um, but it's it's not impossible. It's 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 some some Chad, cosmologists Chad, even say Chad, it's possible. Chad, we don't. Do, do you believe in everything that you think is not impossible? 
No, but it's I'm, then I'm, don't I'm not fucking no no no, no don't out. but don't but listen that was a yes or no question. If you don't believe in everything, just because you don't think it's impossible, and by the way, it may be impossible. You could be wrong about whether or not it's it's impossible or not. But if you're not going to believe in everything just because it's not impossible, then don't raise that as a reason to believe something. If I point out an objection to an argument and your response is, well, it's not impossible, okay, so fucking what? That's no reason to believe anything. That's pretty lazy, honestly. And if you really extrapolate that out to try to find some belief in a God, because if you don't, I mean, what's the point of the conversation? I mean, you could say that, yeah, there's some deity, but there's no evidence that there's any deity anywhere doing anything for anyone. So what difference does it make in this big argument about the multiverse? And it's not impossible that some deity spun this off into existence. Big fucking deal. Yeah. Oh, man, my argument was never that I think there's a proof of deity. I just say it's since not impossible. This theory out there exists. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, so what? Wait, 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 it's, wait, wait. It's not impossible that a unicorn started the universe. I mean, where do you stop with that? Sure. I'm, Chad, I'm not. I'm not disputing Chad, that. Chad. I'm not disputing. Chad. That. Yeah. Chad. It says here that you have an argument for God. Is that the case, or do you just have an argument that says God isn't impossible in my opinion? I never said that. that that's that's. UQ was wrong, man. I know that's not never my argument. What do you believe about God, Chad? Personally, Can, yourself? do you have an argument for the existence of God or not? No, I don't. I just have the then argument goodbye. that it's impossible. Goodbye. It's not. Impossible. I don't that's care fine. if, in your opinion, it's plausible <laughs> or possible. Oh, yeah. You have zero expertise, zero evidence, and zero argument. Why well, that's what I did came you tell in the with. Screener? I'm sorry your information was wrong. It's not my fault that you got wrong information. What do you believe? Chad? Okay, bye. Bye. Okay. All bye. right, bye. He just wants to spit out hypotheses. Yeah, let me I mean, first of all we, we could we could always we could do that all night. Well, it's possible this, it's possible that. What's the point of that? Hey, if you want to suggest um Chad that our call screener got it wrong and is in somehow incompetent at t taking down your information. Um, I highly doubt that because I, I just had a conversation that. with you. And yeah. I'm aware of how difficult it was to get you to acknowledge or make a coherent point clearly. So mm -hmm. don't shit all over the call screener just because you aren't able to string together cogent thoughts. Our call no screeners are come up with if, some if you would, opinions of your own. Yeah, it's any case. Thank you yeah. to our call screeners and our moderators and everybody else. I'm going to take some more calls in just a second, but as a reminder, um, on Transcendent Call and Show tomorrow is going to be Katie and Arden. Uh, Jimmy's going to do it because I want to at some point in the coming days on the Sunday show. It's Jimmy and Forrest, and Monday it's going to be Arn Ron Brian Dalton on Skep Talk, and Tuesday is Hostility with Jimmy Snow and Seth Andrews talking about his new book about ghost stories and stuff like that. And Dying Out Loud premieres on May 16th. I want to make sure we get to uh, these callers that have been patiently waiting. Um, but I want to take this one quickly because I don't want to, to ha have this person hanging around too long. So Mike mm. in Canada, pronouns are he, him, uh, was questioning my approach to callers. What point did you want to make, Mike? Where's, where's our point of disagreement? Hey Matt, thanks for taking my call. It's actually California, not Canada, but uh, oh, that doesn't my, really my matter. apologies. Then. <laughs> oh no, no problem. Hey, uh, yeah, so you know uh, what I was saying in chat was, you know, maybe I, I used the word bullying, which might have not been the right term to use, but just for clarity, so that I understand, you know, I am a fan of yours. I do watch the show, uh, <clears throat> and I do appreciate your logic and you know, the arguments that you come back with. The one thing I don't understand, which I don't think is as productive in conversations, is when you fly <laughs> off the handle so quickly and start demeaning the callers and saying, like, shut the fuck up, fuck you, and all these other things. And I think, to me, that kind of... When, when does that happen, Mike? Mike, when oh, does okay. that happen? Well, I have an example. 
Okay, I can give you a perfect example. I, I, no, that. hang on, hang on. Yeah, I'm not ahead. denying that it happens. I'm asking you okay. a specific question. When in the course of a call does it happen? Because you characterized it as me flying off a handle. Is there something yeah. that happens that causes that? Like someone refusing to argue honestly and answer the question they've been asked? Yeah, no, no, for sure. I think it's mostly when somebody doesn't answer a question that you ask them. Yeah, yeah. And, so and how many times and how many question. shows have I, have, how many times and how many shows have I made it clear that people need to ask the, answer the question that they're asked? Um, but you think it's not very productive. No. How many shows like this have yeah. you hosted and for how long? Well, I haven't hosted any, but... D do you have, I mean, do you have some data? Do you have some data about how effective it is? And do you know what my goal is? Because you would need to know my goal in order to know how effective well, it is, right? That's true. So I wonder, that's true. And I wonder so if what your goal you, is for, for a show to put on a good show, or is it nope. actually for your audience, the larger audience that you have, you're trying to, you know, reach them maybe that's on the other line, not necessarily the person that you're talking to. Correct. I think maybe that I, I might be your goal. I would say that's pretty accurate, that if I have someone on a phone okay. call who's not arguing honestly, who's not making a good case, um, who has represented that they aren't willing to see reason at this particular moment, my goal isn't to change their mind. My goal is to uh, expose their flawed thinking to all the other people who share sure. it and to everybody else who'd like to learn how to do it. Now, at what point do you think I fly off the handle and why isn't it justified? Yeah, sure. I'll give you, well, that's why I wanted to give you an example from a couple of days ago. Um, I believe the caller was um, Pashwa or uh, what was his name? Dawa. D A W A H. Yes, perfect Dawa. Yeah, Dawa. So if you, if you go back and uh, you can watch that again, you might have watched it. But if you go back and watch it again, I mean, the guy was like super calm going through it. Doesn't matter. And it's just, why, man, why, at no, some point. No. Mike? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Somebody what? can be super calm and still be dishonest in argument and annoying as fuck. Why should I have to? Why should I have to ask the same question over and over and over again? Why does someone get points for calmly failing to address the conversation? Well, I think there's a couple of okay, good good point on that. But I think at other times maybe you ask it one time. You ask a question one time, and if they don't immediately answer you right away, you just explode on them. And I just don't no, think sir. That that's No, sir. No, sir. You, I, I, you came up with an example. We went with perfect Dawa. And now, yeah. when I push back on what you've said, now you want to say what well, happens differently in other situations. That I, that I fly okay, right no, off the handle. The in, I'm still talking. No. That I fly right off the handle the instant somebody does that. In my opinion, yes. With Dawa, if you go back and listen to it, when he answered a question, you asked him a question. He hasn't answered the question. And he didn't answer it right away. What's that? Yes. He didn't answer the, yeah. Did you see the debate that I did with him prior to the show? No, I did not. I did not see that. Go before. watch that. Go watch that. Okay. All right. Because I no longer give a shit what you think about this. You Mike, have zero let me expertise. Find, let me find that. You have you know you have zero expertise. You have zero yes. data, and the example that you gave is one oh, where my, somebody who I debated, who only wants you know attention, my, I'm still fucking you know talking. Expertise? You know my expertise. I'm is, still Matt? fucking I'm talking, Mike. King. Mike, Go do you ahead. not understand that I'm in the middle of talking? What's wrong with you? Go ahead. Go ahead. Why are you trying to talk over me? Go. I just asked you a question. Why are you trying to talk over me? There's a little bit of a delay. I apologize for that. Please go. Cool. Please continue. Yeah. So now that you've interrupted. Uh oh. I had a debate with this individual who seemed more interested in promoting their live stream afterwards. And they called into the to, called into the Sunday show this past Sunday. And the topic that they said they wanted to discuss was why we needed God. And it took quite a bit of, answer, of, of question asking to get them to the point where they said, it doesn't matter whether you believe that God exists, and God doesn't care whether you believe that he exists. He just wants you to follow his commandments. 
which is, in, which is the, the exact opposite of the argument he was supposed to be making, because if we don't, we don't need God then, and we don't need to believe that a God is there. And the question that I kept asking was, how do you know that a given commandment is from God? A question he repeatedly refused to answer. Instead of disrespecting all of the people watching to make them sit there and listen to someone who I've already demonstrated in a debate the week before is a dullard of epic proportions who will not answer the question. I exposed the fact that even though I kept asking the question, he would not answer that question because he is interested in being a nuisance, getting a clip, trying to say that, oh, the atheist lost his shit. Yes, because one of us is actually serious about this and one of us knows what the fuck he's talking about and the other one is trying to get attention, which is why he put up a clickbait video called Crazy Matt Dillani because he'll get more clicks from my name than he will ever get from any argument he ever presents. Now, if you don't like the way I do stuff, you can go do better on your own, can't you? Sure can. I mean, I could try. Then do it. Yeah. Then do it. All right. That's yeah, all. Mike, hey, Matt, that's Mike. all. Mike. That's all. That's right. all I wanted to say. It wasn't a bullshit. Huge... Bullshit. No, bullshit. Mike. No, that's not. That is not all you want to say. Go ahead, Dave. That's that's dishonest because you came in here to to criticize Matt for the way he does his show and the way he interacts with callers, and and Matt showed highlighted the fact that you don't actually do it yourself. It's easier to sit on the sideline and criticize someone like Matt because why, let me ask you this, Mike, why should Matt have to ask someone the same question three or four or five times? Is it three or four or five times? Sometimes it's one time. No, Sometimes it's, no, it's he, maybe at the most two times. Go back when, and when listen asked, to the video. Mike, when he asks a question and the caller does not answer the question, what should he do? Say it again, repeat it again, because you know there's there's other scenarios why? That, why? that go on with the call. Listen, why? Let, let when me, he has let experience me try, with me, this guy. Why? Let me try. Hold. Be, be quiet for a minute. Let me try to answer oh, you. Oh, okay. no! Whoa. Fuck you! You don't Hang like on. me talking. Hang on. What the hell? Now Mike? your ass is muted, Mike. You don't tell my fucking guests to be quiet. No. What Ever. the hell? I'm gonna unmute the you in fuck a second. Do you think you are? Despite the fact that you're a fucking liar, because literally what I said, and people can rewind, is that if all is that you don't like the way I do stuff and you think you could do it better, and your response was, Yes, that's all I wanted to say, which makes you a liar. Because there's no way you're here calling in just to say, I don't like the way you do it, I could do it better. Because if you could do it better, why aren't you? But instead, apologize to Dave and then we'll consider letting you finish your thought. Okay, I apologize for doing that, Dave. I really do. Thank you. I flew off a little, little bit off the handle there. I apologize. Imagine how you do See? on an actual show if you, if you can't handle it Dave. I mean, I'd be happens. like you, Matt. I know. I would be crazy. Well, you do this for 17 years like Matt has. Uh, I'm not crazy. And no, you wouldn't are. be like me. You've been on exactly one call here with Dave and already did worse than I did, yet you're calling in to say how you could do better. You're full of shit, Mike. You don't know what you're talking about. Listen, go ahead, you finish. say I don't have credentials. Hold, hold on one second. You say I don't have credentials. Or data. Or you say, data. You say, you say, well, this is my experience. My experience is being a human being and for 49 years talking with people as a human being. Yes, maybe it's not on the show. Maybe I don't have a YouTube streaming show you know, we're with, with thousands or however many uh, people in the audience, but that does not mean that I can't have a conversation and understand what it means to treat another human with respect during a conversation and know what's productive. How dare let's, you say let me, that? Let me suggest, I don't know that. Let me suggest okay. No, first, let no, suggest hang on. This. Hang on for one second. Did I say that you don't know how to talk to someone with respect? <laughs> No, you, no, you did not say that. Then you why did I you just accuse me of it? Then why did you just accuse me of saying that and say, how dare I? Because why did you, you accuse me of saying something because that I did not say? By, Mike, by why did you accuse me? I don't have the credibility. Mike, why did you say, why did you accuse me? Mike, why did you accuse me of saying something that I did not say? 
I'm trying to answer you. You inferred it by saying that. No, sir. I don't no, sir. You don't even know what fucking infer means. No, you, the listener infers, the speaker implies. But I did not imply that you don't know how to talk to people with respect. And I did not say that. So why did you accuse me of that? I don't remember accusing you of that, but if I did, then I apologize. Well, how, how fucking awesome, Mike, that you can keep being shitty and disrespectful to me and then just say, I don't remember and apologize afterwards. What do you mean? Keep on I, doing it. How many times have I done it? How many times Before, have you been disrespectful to me during this call? And to Dave? I was being disrespectful to you. Matt, right, really? I mean, out of all the all, out of all the times that I listen to you disrespecting other people, you're going to sit here and tell me. <laughs> yeah. That when, Mike, you're, you're, when did I disrespect a person, Mike? When I just gave you an yeah. example. So you think you think you, you think back? that I disrespected yeah. Dawa? So was Dawa disrespecting me in the audience by refusing to answer the question by taking up our valuable no, time? I did not, no. No, 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 no. I hang on. Listen, I don't, I don't, hang on. I don't think not Mike, responding to a Mike, question hang is disrespecting. On. I want you to, I want to, I want you to be clear because you just said no to that question. I'm going to ask it one more time and you can then say no again. Was perfect Dawa being disrespectful to me in the audience by refusing to answer questions and by taking up time on the show with nonsense? No. Because you know, not to explain you why buy, I Mike. say no. Goodbye, Mike. We have a fundamental disagreement there, and I no longer give a fuck what you think, nor do you need to spend any more time here. Because the fact of the matter is, if someone calls in and they don't respect the process or me or our audience enough to actually pay attention and listen and answer the questions they're asked and instead wait for their turn to speak, and wait for their opportunity to preach, they have begun with disrespect and are no longer deserving of respect. I will not be lectured to by you or anybody else on how to respect people who are actively disrespecting the very process of having this conversation. I defy you to go find a single call where someone of good faith had a conversation, started a conversation, and played along and answered the questions and that I was disrespectful to them. I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but you find it and I'll address that. But it's, in the it's meantime, always when they won't answer the question, it's always when they uh, yeah. obfuscate and they, they deflect and they don't, they're dishonest with the intention of their call. And I, I mean, Mike, go, go start your own channel and yeah. let's see how you do after a few years when, when people call in and, and treat you with disrespect and we don't, won't have an honest conversation. Let's see how you do, because yeah. you've already shown that you can get pretty up in the up in the air with stuff pretty quickly. You've already demonstrated yep. that, Mike. I was uh, I was going to yeah. say, Mike, and anybody else who wants to start their own network, I have two videos ready to send you now. I will show you how to do exactly what I do. <laughs> I will show you how we run. I am so not afraid of any competition in this space because if Bring they it. were actually good enough competition, that would only help us. And if they're like Mike, I don't have to worry about it. I will send you the video showing you step by step how everything on this channel is done. All you got to do is yep. email me for it. Actually, no, become a patron because they get it for free. Fuck you, pay for it. Go become a patron to get it. It's, Mike it's has just really wild. It in the call tonight that he couldn't keep his cool. Yeah. I mean, come on. I've been doing this for 20 years. And one of the things, here's, here's one of the problems for the people who are like, gosh, why does this have to get so heated? Um, I, I, I understand that people don't know what it's like, A, to sit in the chair that, that Dave and I sit in. But also, I've done it so long that I pick up on some things quicker than some other people do. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't heard every dishonest response and every dodging uh, question or question dodging exercise that goes on, you may not recognize them as much. For example, I made a post on Facebook the other day specifically and sorry to do this um the atheist community of austin 
has been taking old content, which they legally own and can use if they want to, and they've been repackaging it either in a 24-7 channel or to make little YouTube reels and stuff like that. And many of them, much of that content features me. I would never ask them to take down old content, and I wasn't complaining about old content. But when they started doing that, they're essentially advertising for the Atheist Community of Austin and then putting up reels of me. And what happens in that case is people then message me and say, hey, are you back with the ACA? Is all this, is all this over? Are you back? Are you ready to do it? So they're giving people the wrong impression. And all I said on Facebook was that I wish they'd stop doing that. That's it. Well, no, I went a little further because I, I did do stay classy at the end because uh, it's the same organization that locked me out of my emails and where somebody in the leadership just flat out fucking lied to me. But the, the objection there was, I get it. I worked for this organization or worked with this organization or ran it for 18 and a half years. There's no way for them to produce like a best of, well, it would be very difficult for them to produce a best of clip or run a 24 seven channel and not show me. And I have no, they have every legal right to that content. I'm not talking about that. They can, they can put it up. But when you take that and you start posting clips as if it was new content, um, and specifically it's like, Hey, come advertise. And they're doing it with, you know, there's, there's clips of Tracy up. She hasn't been with the organization in years. Um, Jenna, there's a number of people who, who want nothing to do with the organization who are still being you know, propped up there in their advertisements. And I think it's also, as long as I'm on a little tirade here, I think it's disrespectful to the many good people who are there working and producing content right now that the advertisements have people who haven't been with the shows or whatever in six months. In response to that, somebody came on that particular thread and said, hey, you might not be aware, but in your bio, it lists president at atheist-community.org. Now, some people legitimately thought that that individual was just politely <laughs> trying to uh, make a well-intentioned response, uh, uh, just advise me of something that may be wrong in my bio. And... Uh, I immediately recognize it because there's no way somebody just happens to see something in my bio and go, gosh, maybe I should let Matt know that just in case he overlooked this as an error. Because first of all, you can do that in private. When you post it as a response to me talking about the ACA using my stuff, you're suggesting that I'm making a hypocritical compa complaint. That, and somebody else jumped in to say that I was basically using them for advertisement. And I lit into those people. You go fucking learn how to read a bio. It also says I went to Francis L. High School. Do you think it, that means I'm still in high school? Um, and literally, when you go onto Facebook and do it, it says work experience, not current work. In any case, this wasn't a, 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 about that. It was about people's perceptions that I was being mean to someone who was only trying to help. And I get that most of you can't see it. Until you've been in a position where you are under attack or likely to be under attack all day, every day. You may not see and pick up on the trends of people doing this. This wasn't somebody who wasn't a friend or anything else who was trying to come in and be snarky. And I called him out for it. And if you can't see it, fine, I get it. I look like a dick to those people. And that's fine. Just realize that my life is often a little different from everybody else's. That that's it. All all, but if all the world's a all the world's a critic. Uh, people, yeah. it, it it's always fascinating to me that the people who don't jump in and do stuff themselves feel the most compelled to tell everyone else how to do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and take this call really quickly uh, because we've gone on about this. Uh, Kyle in Florida, you had a question about um, epistemology. So welcome to the show. I'll try and give you a, as quick an answer as I can, especially since you you waited so long. So thanks for your patience. Yeah, no worries, even Dave, even Matt. Um, so yeah. rather than get into the weeds about the response, it just he responded to your debate review. And as, every time he paused, it was like his statement was, it's just a fact that God sent messengers. Or everyone knows that if you split the moon, and a lot of his epistemology was just, you know, assertions with, and then he would read something from, you know, a holy text. And yeah. it sort of reminded me a lot of someone in my life who I think is really struggling with the loss 
of someone close to her and um, they're going to like a grief share that has, I think, dubious methods, like really scripture based. And when I try to talk to her about it, I get very similar answers like, you know, I just know that I'll see him again. Or if I ask her a difficult question, it'll be something like, well, you'll have to ask God that when you see him, because I know that when you die, you'll see him. How do I engage with someone whose epistemology is just on such a basic level like that? Mm. Well, I, thoughts, so I thought you were going to ask I'm about sorry. how to dig in on the basics <laughs> of epistemology. And frankly, I tend to direct people. It's it's a little heavy at first, but uh, even just the Wikipedia articles on the basics of logical arguments of syllogisms. Um, I tend to recommend the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy online for, for more detailed views on epistemology. But when you're talking about somebody who has, I don't know, less than an armchair understanding of even what epistemology is, mm-hmm. um, I don't know if there's a really good kind of intro resource. I think you have to have conversations that may seem silly which is like, okay, let's make up two competing com- competing claims and try to figure out what would it take to have a reasonable belief that one of them was right and one of them was wrong and do it for something completely unrelated to the, the subject you're arguing about. If you're arguing about religion, make it about a scientific fact and then talk about the difference between exploring scientific facts and, and, and exploring um, religious claims. Should they be scientifically testable you know should there be evidence for god how on earth did they detect god and yet science can't that that type of thing all right and, and uh, i was going to really say some, well sometimes you like matt said there's that they have a less than rudimentary understanding of epistemology or even there are just some people there that want to believe certain things because they want to believe them and it makes them feel good especially when it gets to dealing with death and grief and going to see mom again, going to see my husband again. I, you know, I know Christians who don't think very deeply and haven't studied anything that would lend itself to any kind of evidence. And you're not going to appeal to them with, with evidence uh, or logic or reason. They just want to believe because they want to believe. And I don't think at the end of the day, you're really going to get anywhere with them. It's just like, like my mom, she just knows she's going to see my dad. Uh, in heaven again when she dies and i i could say well which dad because i've got a stepdad and a birth father who both claim to be christians so which one are you going to be with i mean i could argue that with her but it wouldn't change the fact that she's locked into the notion that she's going to spend eternity with the the husband she liked the most and spent the most time with i mean there's no logical reason for that it's just so there's no ep- epistemological argument that's going to sway her or convince her and at the end of the day, it really doesn't make much difference uh, anyway in that particular case. And it's frustrating yeah. because we wish people would think more logically and would apply more reason to what they believe and why they believe it. But at the end of the day, a lot of people just don't. Right. I just, I, I guess I struggle with seeing her struggle with getting over the death. And yeah. you know, like the way I put it is, I know I'm not going to see him again, and I'm at peace with that. And I wish that I could see you at peace, even if it was through believing that you're going to see him again. But I don't see that. And I get answers like, you know, well, there's no time limit on grief, and everyone grieves differently. And I understand that to some degree. But when it's still very detrimental to you occasionally, like Mm -hmm. even if it's once a month, like it's tough for me to see that, right? As someone that I'm close to. But, yeah, yeah if, I, if there's I get, really nothing I can I can do. I at, see at that. Sort of the, yeah, I see yeah. some of that in the ALS community. People, I'm, I have ALS, a terminal disease, and most of the people in that community, in the uh, groups that we interact with, Bevan and I online or even in person, most of the people have some sense of faith. They believe that they're going to go to heaven when they die because we're all with ALS, we're, we're approaching that finish line 
a lot sooner than we thought we were going to. And it, it, it somehow is comforting to them to know that they're going to go to a better place and their suffering will end. My response to them whenever they want to dialogue about that or to anyone who who's lost or losing a partner is, is how is that affecting your life now? Because my position is we have this one life. It's the only one we have. And if my vision of an afterlife or what's next is where my focus is and where all of my attention is, it's most likely going to negatively affect this one life and the quality of the life that I have and the days that I have left. And so I try to appeal to people about that. You know, don't let your fantasy about an afterlife or a reuniting with a loved one negatively affect the one life you have. You're running out of days. Make the most of them. And that's the only thing I can appeal to people with because I think that's the most important thing for me. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. That's uh, that's all really helpful. Um, Jimmy, Thanks, I'd Scott. love to see those videos and also fuck you. Fuck you, buddy. <laughs> much appreciated, Kyle. Hey, we got two more callers on the line. And, um, oh, let, let's let's do it this way. Andy, uh, proud to see him in Illinois, who's is a theist. Welcome to the hang up on the line. Uh, can you hear me? The button's not appearing. It said wood. We hear Hello? you. We oh, hear okay. You. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your time, Matt and Dave. I think I can make uh, an argument uh, why personal testimony, while not conclusive, should be taken uh, into account. Why it might imply higher work, higher powers at work in this world. Um, and then I want to. So basically, my argument is that yes, there's bias, and yes, there is mismemory, but. The world kind of revolves around personal testimony, even though it can be false. And one of the great things about science is it weeds out bias and it's repeatable. So why not conclusive? I think that many of the experiences people have, even though many of them are probably false, um, they can be taken into account that might imply higher powers at work because they're so common. Um, and what should be done with them, I think, and this may or may not pan out, and it's been tried before, but just because they haven't proven yet doesn't mean it's not true is like a scientific approach to um, if, if um, taking these testimonies and seeing the commonalities and the, the falsehoods that, uh, you know, like repeatable, like a, applying a scientific method to them. But I just think that personal testimony in many cases may imply a higher power at work because while your mind can deceive you, it's basically, and that's why science tries to weed out bias, it is the only tool we really have in accepting that other people are real and you're not a brain bad and you have to take personal testimony and count to some That's degree. Not, so first of all, you can't, you can't solve that problem or demonstrate that you're the, you're not the only mind or that you're not a brain of that, but let's just go with personal testimony. Let's say someone claims they were abducted by aliens. Now that claim, that testimony is either true or it's not true. Correct? Yes, I agree. If it's not true, is that evidence for alien abductions? No. If it's true, it would then be evidence for alien abductions, is what you're saying. Yes. If we don't have any way of telling, if we don't have any way of telling if any individual claim is true or not true, how can we count it as evidence for the claim? Good point. But what I would say to that is that um, we have to use our best judgment in this case. And I think the science, uh, logical scientific method should be applied to this. And my argument is that there are so many commonalities in experiences in the mind and, 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 and like things that happen to people that are inexplicable that imply higher powers that work in this world. There are common themes throughout history. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's not answering the question that I asked. Okay, I'm sorry. If we have no it? way of telling, if we have no way of telling if an individual claim is true or not true, how can it be considered evidence for the claim? Well, you'd have to vet it, is my point. If like, we have no have way of telling, 
Vet, vetting is to verify the claim, right? Right. If we have no way of telling if the claim is true or not true, how can it be considered evidence for the claim? Okay, well, what I would say to that is that many scientific claims have not been proven at the time they're proposed, but were proven If we later. have no way of proving whether it's true or not true, how can you consider it evidence for the proposition? I think we do have a way of proving it true eventually. Why didn't you say uh, that the first five times I asked you that question? Okay, um, if we have, hang on, if we have a way of proving it eventually, do we have a way of proving it now? I would say no. Then is it evidence now or evidence when we can finally prove it? I think the evidence could be built upon to eventually prove it conclusively. And I think that is can it be done by Is it evidence. evidence now or is it evidence once you can prove it? It is not conclusive evidence. But it, wow, yeah, I think it's it so be. funny. It's so funny to watch you tap dance because the correct answer there is it does not count as evidence now. It does not count as evidence till you can prove it. But instead, you said it doesn't count as, con or it isn't conclusive evidence. So you can't even answer the straightforward question that I led you to like a horse to water. You can lead someone to a conclusion, but you can't make them think. If, if you have five claims, if you have five claims that all say they saw a ghost and you have no way of proving any of them are true, which ones of those count as evidence towards the claim that ghosts exist? I have to disagree with the premise. Let me ask you a question. No, if, sir. If, I just gave you a scenario and asked you a question. <laughs> answer that question. If we have five well, claims, if, okay, if well, uh, it, shut up. Listen to the question carefully. If, that means this is a hypothetical, so you can't reject the premise. If there are five claims that they saw a ghost and we have no way of proving which of those are true, which of those five claims are evidence for ghosts existing? That was the question. Oh, all of them. And I, and I, and I, I well, the, no. because they're repeatable. No, you already rebutted that, but go ahead. No, I'll, I'll, I'll right. entertain well, this for a second. Because you literally, you, five, because you literally, you literally, two minutes ago, said that if you have no way of telling whether or not it's true, that it doesn't count as evidence for the claim. And now you're reversing yourself. So please explain why you are engaging in a logical fallacy right in front of our eyes. Go ahead. Okay. Well, if you have five claims that ghosts exist, is that not a repeatable experience? It's five testimonies. Everything is built no. on testimony. No, that makes no sense. Andy, let me let me throw back a different scenario. Rather than ghosts, let's talk about witches. Are you familiar with the Salem witch trials in our country's yeah. history? Yeah. Okay. There was testimony from these girls that their witches, there were witches in the in the village that were causing them to to gyrate and go through these contortions. And they all repeated the same testimonies. And these people died. These supposed witches died. Now, we know they weren't witches. They were just human beings. I hope you know they weren't witches. I hope you know witches aren't a thing. But these girls all had similar testimony, similar experiences. Why were they doing this? We don't know. But real world consequences happen when people believe things based on testimony and no evidence. That doesn't prove these people were witches, does it? No, and I agree with you. But what I would point out, there was also contradictory testimony in that case. That doesn't make any difference. Andy, you're still uh, saying you're still saying that human testimony and experience is enough evidence to go on. I say it's the basis of all evidence we have it, that needs to no. be built upon. Oh my God. No, it's not. And you also <laughs> claimed that the five claim scenario I gave you, you said, is that not repeatable uh, claims? And no, they're not repeatable. That's not what repeatable means in science. It doesn't mean five people reporting something doesn't make it a repeatable, testable claim. How do you test that? Okay. Well, can we, if we're, if we're going to go with 
uh, here's what I'm going to say. If every, the reason I say everything is built on testimony, even science, and science is a very good mechanism for weeding out bias and bad testimony. Andy. But in the end, in the end, you have to depend upon the results and the testimony of the scientists. And yes, they can show it in the lab, but you have to accept other people. It was too late. It no, was too you late don't. No, you don't. Burned. You can you do it yourself. It you, 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 can, you can do the test yourself. I can pick up this pair of glasses and look at it and touch it. I don't have to rely on somebody else's testimony. If you want to say I'm still relying on my senses, then congratulations. You've now moved from your ridiculous claim that someone saying they saw a ghost is and is not evidence that they saw a ghost to we can't solve hard solipsism. You are all over the place, Andy. I asked simple questions. If someone says, I witnessed this, and we have no way of telling whether or not it's true, that cannot count as evidence for that event happening. Okay, I don't think you're, I think you're, I don't think you're getting what I'm saying. Um, let me ask you a question. When Galileo looked into, test, uh, it looked into his telescope, he was censored. He, that was what he saw with his eyes and his senses. That, that's, and that is the basis of a lot of things that go on. Now, no, I'm not Andy, saying... no, 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 Andy. What Galileo saw in his telescope could be seen by anybody else who put their fucking eye up to that telescope, correct? That's my point. No, 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 it's not your fucking point. Yeah, yeah that is no, part of sir. my point. No, Andy, no. It does not mean that we are reliant on Galileo's testimony of what he no. saw, are we? The point is, if you refuse to look in the are telescope, we? You're, you're, no, you're disproving but you're never your own point, Andy. Uh, point you're is, disproving if, your own point. The point if is, you never if you listen said, to Galileo and don't okay, look no, in the I'm telescope. I'm going to mute you. Oh, my God. So that I don't have to keep telling you to how, shut up. How does he not get this? How does uh, he you doesn't want to get it? You said, Andy, that we had to rely on Galileo's testimony of what he saw through the telescope. And I pointed out that anybody else could look through there. That's how you get a repeatable, testable thing, which is, hey, when I look through here, here's what I saw. And somebody else can come along and say, hey, when I look through here, here's what I saw. And we can compare these accounts independently to find out whether or not they're consistent. That is a process. That is not five testimonial accounts. That is five different people assessing data that anyone can, can assess. That type of thing doesn't exist with a ghost claim or a God claim or a spirit claim. So when you say that we have to rely on Galileo's testimony, you're wrong. And when I corrected you to show that you were wrong and that we don't have to rely on Galileo's testimony, you sat here and said, that was your point. Are you capable of addressing this stuff honestly? I'm sorry that you yes, keep you, getting caught. I believe in a I either misspoke or you wow. just straw main made about Galileo. Mm, okay. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I wasn't done talking. I took you off mute just in preparation of trying to give you time. But now you're going to say that either you misspoke or I straw manned you. Go back and listen to what was actually said. Here's the question. The... Okay. When Galileo... Okay. No. Congratulations, okay. you little jackass. You don't ever get to speak again. When I say, here's the question, and I'm trying to move to that, and you're like, can I speak? You should know the answer is going to be no. Is this your listening, first time? Listening skills aren't great. You should know the answer is going to be no. I get that, you, that you'd really like for there to be some way to think that testimony is enough. Sometimes testimony is all we have. And so we try. It's not proof. Yeah. Yeah. We try to say, okay, here's what the claim was. Here's what this person is saying they saw. Is this consistent with the facts that we have? If somebody says, I saw Dave Warnock the other day. And um, he was uh, typing an email at about 90 words a minute. Now, that's an awesome claim. I would love few things more than watching Dave 
type at 90 words a minute. But that claim is inconsistent with facts that I have currently. Could I be wrong? You bet. Dave could be just faking all this for attention. And um, when he's not here on the show, he could be typing a thousand words a minute for all I know. I can't imagine anybody typing that fast. It'd be, wow, it'd be really cool. But the claim itself <laughs> needs evidence to support it. And if five people came up and say they saw Dave doing this, I would have to look into it and say, is there a way to find out if these five people are correct? Maybe they know a different Dave. Maybe there's other information. It's not the claim that is evidence. It is all of the facts in the world around us, and the claim is either consistent with those facts, in which case it may be reasonable to accept it, or the claim's not consistent with those facts, in which case you need supporting evidence. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if 100 people say they saw a ghost, first of all, I think Andy mistakenly thought they were all reporting the exact same uh, visual occurrence to, to claim that it was uh, repeatable. But it doesn't, the number of people who claim something doesn't make it more believable. The truth isn't impacted by the number of people who believe it or the number of people who testify that they believe it. But just watching me try to scratch my nose just now will indicate that I can't type 90 words a minute, 50 words a minute, 20 words a minute, three words a minute. <laughs> yeah, but you're just a big faker, anyway. Dave. Yep, I'm making a lot of money off this ALS fakery. Yep. I tell you what, we got some super chats to get to, and I, I thank you to, to everybody who called in, including uh, Andy and including Mike, um, who called mm. in to attempt to make their cases. It's really frustrating when I sit here and ask very specific questions, get somebody yep. to admit something, and then they turn around and say the opposite. Literally, Within a minute or two after saying, nope, that wouldn't count as evidence, all of a sudden it does count as evidence when it's something that, you know, is conveniently consistent with what the person believes. But, all right, I don't have control of the Super Chats today, so Jimmy, producer, thank you. Look at that, how awesome that was. I'm going to, I'll start with the easy one here. $20 from Eric America. So first of all, thank you so much, Erica, and for making it incredibly easy to read your super chat. Nine ninety nine from Jason Friedman. Is the world getting better? Oh man. Uh, depends on what you define better. I think in some ways it is in some ways it's not. What do you think, Matt? Better for whom? That's true. I mean, it's not getting better for Dave. Nope, it's, that's, um, that's a good point. It's probably, there. in many ways, I think there's lots of categories in which it's getting worse for all of us. There are probably some ways in which it's getting better for all of us. I mean, we are continuing to make um, scientific exploration. We are, we are learning more about medicine stuff. I'm still holding out hope that, you know, we'll, we won't end the world through sloppy uh, reasoning and that we'll find a cure for cancer and ALS and all these other things to actually make the world better for people. I think whether or not the world is getting better or worse is, is something you can't uh, easily answer. You need a little bit more criteria. But I That's would true. say on the average right now, I don't think it's getting better. I don't, I don't see, I don't feel, I'm, I'm still optimistic about the future, but I don't see the world. I can't look at the world and go, things are getting better. I just think that it may be possible for them to, to not get too much worse too quickly. I think sometimes with this question, I think the only way to even think that it gets better is if you really put a lot of effort into uncovering all the ways the world used to be shit that you didn't even know. You have to like go yeah. find higher quantities of past shit to really justify it. It's hard to do. Yeah. Five dollars from I Got Cookies. Will Genevieve be on your new show too, Dave? I got cookies. Hey, um, you know what? Tune in. Uh, I think yes, yes and no. Not regularly, but she will be um, a co-host on a regular basis. I would say. 
And I like Genevieve a lot too. So Genevieve is going to be my guest. I th- maybe next week. I think. Yes. I think it's next week. Yep. yep. She's awesome. Yeah. Good stuff. And and maybe she'll do a better job of keeping me calm since Dave riles me up. I know. I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an instigator. Twenty dollars from Satan's little helper. I will never understand this about Christians that this supposed God wants you to believe in him. And if you do, you are rewarded. If you don't, you get punished. Beliefs are internal. So why am I being rewarded or punished on my thoughts? Mm. That's something we'll never understand till we get to the other side and God explains it to us. But yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, that makes no sense that we are punished for thought crimes essentially. Yeah. I've, I've complained about the ridiculousness of, of that. Um, not the least of which is like, I, you know, you're, oh, you've had impure thoughts. A lot of the thoughts that re- religions want to, to make a problem, um, they're normal and they're not harming anybody. And there are people who have thoughts. You have to, like, for example, I've never rob a bank, but have I spent some time thinking about the perfect way to rob a bank? You bet I have, because I like heist movies and I, I like the mystery and the puzzle of it. And, oh, is there a way? And how would you do it? And the, could this be that that's entertaining? Um, when I, I mean, when here, I yeah, watch, you wouldn't here. I dare say you wouldn't rob a bank if you were guaranteed that you wouldn't get caught. Would, would you say that's yeah. true? Yeah, See, I, I would have. I me. mean, I, I, I could use the money. It's just wrong. Okay, wait a second. Which bank? No. Because I'm a socialist, <laughs> and I'd like to chime in that that could actually be a moral action. <laughs> right. If you're, if you're guaranteed to not get caught, which bank? I, I don't know what There's you're saying, Jimmy. We just, he just thinks uh, he's saying, show me the bank. I'll go get it right tonight. Dave's hypothetical was if you were guaranteed to not get caught, you still wouldn't rob a bank. If I was Correct. guaranteed to not get caught, I would rob many banks <laughs> like as many as not you know probably not small ones but are you kidding Why? me like what's the what is the what is the immorality of stealing from a giant mega bank first of Truly. all who do you think winds up paying when you do that it's, it's not nobody your money. it basically disappears no no it's, no 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 that's ridiculous it's not nobody oh man oh we can't there's no way to do this quickly but stealing from billionaire banks, mega banks, is basically a victimless crime. No, it's absolutely not. Those Hard losses disagree. are passed on to their customers the same way stealing from Walmart is passed on to the customers. And we pay for it in taxes and the guarantees that, that it protects them. You, you don't get to I, claim that robbing a bank is a victimless crime. That's we, ridiculous. I, truly, truly, we couldn't... Truly, we couldn't do this quickly, but I couldn't disagree this with This deserves the whole show. Yeah, we'll do this it another show. Be more We're already then. late. We're already late. We're yep. running late, and I'm going to have to have a drink, so we'll have to do this another time. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Opened up a can of worms there. Doesn't matter. Jimmy's never oh, going to well. be able to do it without getting caught. 1999 from Greg Markowski. Thanks for the show, Matt, Dave, and Jimmy. Thanks, Greg. Hey, man. hey Greg. Again, 1999 from Greg Markowski again. Over Christmas, we made sure our MAGA friends and family were invited. Politics were not discussed. As much as I hate their views, I still value them as people. I would hate for all of us to lose half our friends and family. I applaud that, Greg. That's oftentimes hard to do. And the only way I think you can do it is if everyone agrees not to talk about it. Because I'm going to be seeing... A lot of my family um, at my mom's 90th birthday this summer in Texas, and they're all MAGAs. I don't know how deep down that rabbit hole they go, but it's pretty much, and they all know where I stand. So the only way that that can go off without a disastrous chain of events, because I'm not great at not not, uh, speaking up if someone challenges me, um, is if we agree to leave these things unsaid. But I do value the family and friends. Go ahead. $10 for Dante Verona. FYI, I was planning on attending Debate Con 3, but of course I have a scheduling conflict. Uh, I'll be on the lookout for the next event in Dallas County. Still, though, what a pisser. Uh, I'm sorry to miss you. And actually, I'm not going to be there for the whole thing. I'm going to be there 
uh, early in the morning. I think my debate is before lunch. Uh, and then I've got to get back home because we've got snakes that are going to be given, given us eggs any moment. $20 from flanker 420. My sister has fallen victim to every conspiracy theory possible, flat earth, etc. I value our relationship. It seems to be getting worse. I'm a skeptic and atheist. Any advice on how to approach, even if I can't change minds? Ah, uh, yeah, that's tough. I um, I don't know, honestly, Flanker. It's 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 hard to do battle with those conspiracy theories because if they're down that hole, if they believe the Earth is flat, when there is so much evidence to the contrary. I don't know how you I don't know how you get through to them. Matt, you have any secrets there? No. And you know, I've done I did a a, a hangout podcasty thing with um Simon Dan and Conspiracy Cats a, a year or two ago. Um I I would kind of direct them to to that content and the flat earth documentary on Netflix, but if if you're concerned about the relationship and you care more about that than whether or not you convince them that the earth isn't flat, um, sometimes you just gotta let it go. I mean, yeah, I say that doing this show and jumping in and holding people's feet to the fire, but I, I don't have to do that at every conversation in my life with everybody, uh, that I value the relationship with. Yeah, sometimes those falls under the category of just leaving that topic off the table, if you like, can. I'm, now, I'm, if, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly okay with allowing Jimmy to continue to believe that it's not morally wrong to rob a bank uh, if he knows that he can get away with it. Billionaire bank. He's oh, wrong. Shit. We're we're, we're going to be bailing him out of jail. See, I just no, know. no, no. You want to? You we agreed <laughs> to do it later, but you want to keep? No, no, it. no, sir. These super no, chats sir, are going to get real we, slow. We didn't agree to do it later. I did not agree to ever discuss this again. You said we could do it later. I'm hey, I'm sorry. We it to won't move make on. you continue to we be wrong to forever on, right. because you're not going to yeah. actually rob a bank. And so, why would I waste time trying to convince you that something you're never going to do is wrong? It doesn't make sense. That's true. And I, I'm using that to say for Flanker 420, sometimes you can just let it go. Mm -hmm. If you can. 1999 from the Raven 200. I used to be so scared of snakes as a kid. I was so scared I'd refuse to go outside if there was one out there. There's lots of them out there, unless you're in Ireland. Now I want a pet snake or two or four. Great show, everyone. Go take a German suplex from Brock Lesnar, Jimmy. That, that would be rough. <laughs> Yeah, Raven's gotten really clever with the uh, what was just the go fuck yourself, Jimmy meme. It's gotten a little a little graphic. Yeah. I, I don't know from experience, okay. but I suspect that Brock can work pretty stiff. I don't know what any of that means, so I, I'll just move it's on. It's wrestling stuff. Uh, oh, okay. Canadian 20 bucks from Kathleen Moncrief. Hey, Kathleen. Mm. I was told in church that God made women naturally afraid of snakes. Yep. Then I got to hold a boa constrictor when I was nine. So friendly and beautiful and not at all scary. Just interesting and fun to pet. Yep. I, you know, the, the Bible's pretty clear. Put enmity between the woman and the snake. But Yep. Or, or the serpent. I want to make sure we're clear because um, snakes can't talk. $20 Canadian from Nilly Walson. Thanks, Nilly. Nine ninety nine from Caleb Tatro, FWC call. I tried to say goodbye and thank you both for your time, but had some technical difficulty. Also, I, for one, love it when Matt demeans callers. And it, it, Matt doesn't. De, de, Matt doesn't demean callers. I'll take exception. They to demean that. themselves. The demeaning is is uh, really uh, putting someone down. He'll put down an argument. But not the person. Well, when, the, when the person to be fair, is not. I appreciate the well, defense, Dave, but I literally called Perfect Dawa a dullard today. So I absolutely demeaned uh, <laughs> okay. Perfect Dawa. You're, you're right. I, I, it definitely I happened. Directed. And I I'm not always directed. I'm not always proud of it, and I'm not even suggesting that it's a good idea or anything else. But once we've had, once you reach a certain frustration point with somebody, um, 
yeah, I got no problem at all pointing out, no, you are, sorry, just dumber than a sack of hammers and not worth talking to. That's going to be the case on occasion. <laughs> and I'm going to run yeah, into okay. them from time to time. Dumber than a sack of hammers, as it turns out, is a phrase I got from, oh, brother, where art thou? And I didn't realize it until we rewatched it the other day. Oh, I need to say that again. Oh, it's so good. New Zealand 1699 from Lemon Peel Angelfish. So lovely to see you, Dave. Hugs to you, Matt and Jimmy. Look forward to your new show, Dave. Thank you to the crew and the moderators. Yes. Loads of thank, thank you. yous to... Uh, we'll see you there. By the way, to call screener David and Cookies Dylan and Diane, who are our moderators, a special shout out uh, to uh, Apostasy and Skeptics and Scoundrels who are coming on show soon, who uh, evidently were both in, in chat hangout. So I want to make sure we get that done. Cool. 20 bucks from seven dusty lady, seven dust lady. Sorry. Hey guys, just shooting and shooting money through cyberspace at the line and this show. Cause you guys give me hope, love the topics, enjoy the honest discourse. And even the most infuriating calls teach us more about ourselves and the world we live in. Good point. That's exactly what I think you were saying earlier, Matt, that it's not always the caller you're trying to reach. It's the people watching and listening and learning. And yes, even when we get frustrated, even when we lose our cool, it does teach us more about ourselves and the world around us. So good point. And by the way, I'm, I'm not claiming that I'm necessarily doing it the right way. If it turns out Mike's right and he's got a better way, great. <laughs> Just well, I'm anxious go to do see it. his show and see how, see how that goes. I'm sure he's going to start yeah. soon. I will be watching it. $10 from Grumpy Gardener, fungal bungle, manungal bungle. I got fired from my job by my, oh my gosh, by my racist, transphobic, Trump loving boss. And I'm so glad I don't have to hear her reddit cream anymore. Well, I, I'm very happy to hear that you've found an upside in getting fired. Yeah, you're um, free, I guess. But but sorry to hear that you are, uh, are, are have lost that job. Hopefully you have gainful employment really soon. Bounce back. I guess it can't be that bad if you get fired and you come up with a positive thing and then you give money yeah. to the show. Yeah, I guess you're doing all right. I think they were ready to move on, it sounds like. $10 yeah. from Sheridan Ber Bernasconi. Uh, yep. I hope I said that right. Um, great show, Dave and Matt. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Sheridan. $22 Canadian from PDF. Dave, my mom's recent passing from Alzheimer's was heartbreaking. Not ALS, I know. More than ever, my support for you to keep fighting for the right to secular dignity for yourself and others. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Pete. Sorry about your mom's passing. I know Alzheimer's is an equally uh, terrible, terrible way to go, and I'm sorry you had to go through that. Um, and thank you. We're going we're gonna to fight for secular dignity and secular health care. That's one that uh that's one that hits me hard um alzheimer's yeah um because i have i have a fear or a concern that i think is somewhat rational but may also be a bit irrational and that is i'm not afraid of being dead i'm afraid of the mm -hmm. process by which i might die yeah. Uh, being dead is, is nothing. But yeah. Alzheimer's is something that absolutely terrifies me. If you were to say, I'm going to give you a pill and tomorrow you're going to wake up and not remember who you are or anything else. Uh, and it's going to be that way forever. Well, I, I would be opposed to it, but I wouldn't be afraid of it because I know that m me, the person I am right now, isn't going to be experiencing that. And I don't know anything about the new person that would be mm -hmm. in the case of Alzheimer's. It's this slow, frustrating process where it's like some days at some times you've taken that pill and it lasts for a minute, an hour, a day, a week, a month, you have different periods of lucidity and you're, transitioning in and out of that in a way that is an existence that even in the moment of living it i don't know that it would or could bother me but it bothers me now knowing that i could find myself in that situation 
and and not know anything. It's, yeah, it's one of the most I, it's, terrifying it's, things. It's terrifying, I think, more so for you than for you, though. It will be hard on those around you because you're you're not going to be as aware of your unawareness as those around you trying to interact with you. Um, it's terrifying on a different level than, say, ALS, because ALS is the slow disintegration of my body while my mind remains sharp. Like I'm a prisoner in my body. Now, Alzheimer's is almost the opposite. The slow disintegration of my mind while my body still functions. Now, my body quits working because my mind quits telling it to. But the, the, the both of them are equally terrifying because you, you have this slow process that you yeah. have absolutely no, no control over. And while it does affect the person going through it, having seen what it does to Bevan and others around me, it, it affects the people around us probably even more so because they have to watch the disintegration and then I pass on, you pass on. Yeah. And so they've had that slow disintegration and then we go, well, you and I are gone. We go to sleep and don't wake up. They're left to pick up the pieces. It fucking sucks. Yeah. Now that we brought everybody down. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, we'll get, guys. We'll get back to Super Jets. Now, <laughs> I just know that of all the things that I could get hit with, that's the one that I fear yeah. the most. Any sort of mental yeah. dementia, Alzheimer's. $20 yeah. from Regato, hoping to be at your talk in Florida. Always enjoy your shows and days too. I thank you both for, or I thank you both, or too many inspiring insights to list. Uh, keep up the good work, please. I think there's supposed to be four too many four. insights, but thanks so much. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank thanks, you. Regato. Appreciate it. $10 from Emery King. How do you tell if a caller is dishonest versus misunderstanding? Fair. I'm dyslexic and was always accused of not listening when I was trying, but my brain just works differently than quote unquote normal thoughts. No, I can appreciate thoughts. that. Yeah, that's a good question. Take that, Matt. You've, I, I think you could answer that better. Right. First of all, I, I think probably calling in on one of the days when Shannon's here, because Shannon, uh, is also dyslexic, um, would be useful. Um, for me, it's, I, I tend to craft the questions that I'm asking specifically to lead to a, a, a conclusion. Um, there may well be misunderstanding. And when I say dishonest, I don't think these people are willingly, knowingly, consciously saying, oh, I'm going to lie now. Um, what I'm ten, tend to point out is when they have now contradicted themselves, um, as was the case with or, Andy. Or they're deflecting or they're just not wanting to answer the question because they know you've painted them into a corner and they don't like the answer they would have to give. Yeah. When, when I ask question one and I get a yes or no, question two and I get a yes or no, question three and I get a yes or no, and then I get to question four, which is what we've been building towards, and it's, well, that's a good well, question, but I my answer would be, I'd that. have to, yeah. 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 I think what I would say about that, you know, it's yeah. like, it is testimony from understanding. Yeah. That's dishonest. That's not misunderstanding. That's not wanting to answer the question because you know, the answer is not what he wants to say. So, yeah. and, and I could be wrong if someone were to say, uh, no, I'm not being dishonest. Maybe there's a misunderstanding. And okay, let's look at it. It's in these discussions quite frequently. Um, well, when I say they're being dishonest, I'm not saying this person is knowingly lying to us. Yeah, um, yeah, no. Their their dishonesty is. I, I've I've simplified things to the point where anybody should see. If I if I say. Does this piece of glasses in any way prove that there's a God? And they say no. And then they turn around a second later and appeal to these piece of glass, this pair of glasses as if it's relevant to a proof of God. Um, that's mm -hmm. kind of where I get it. Um, yeah, it, it's hard to tell, and I could be wrong. And that's one of the reasons why even when I get pissed off at whoever 
you know, being, in my view, dishonest, um, they tend to get additional chances. They just don't get them today. But, <laughs> but thanks, Emery. $10 from Gabagool. Uh, I can say this. Alexa, play banjo music. Apologies. I'm an agent of chaos. Thank you so much for all you do. Um, that it won't work here because I don't have an Alexa device. Well, if I did that right now, we would hear banjo music. $10 from Jeff Edwards. Great show tonight. Thanks, Dave, for your courage and message. Can't wait for your weekly show. Matt, always a pleasure to watch you. Jimmy, go fuck yourself. <laughs> you go. Something for all of us. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. 1999 from the Raven 200. I love and appreciate everything you do, Dave. Thank you. You as well, Matt. Oh, and Jimmy too, I guess. Just kidding. I genuinely appreciate what Jimmy does as well with and You should have said, go fuck yourself. Uh, keeping awesome the lot of you. Adieu. Thanks, Raven. Thanks, Raven. Appreciate it. Adieu is a reference to a recent, uh, a recent episode of Joseph Smith. Ah. Adieu. 1999 from the Raven 200. From what I've heard, Matt, Brock is actually a safe worker 90% of the time, as long as you don't piss him off. Braun Strowman caught a stiff hook to the head once because he hit Brock too hard. Exception. Yeah, that's why I said that it wouldn't surprise me. I think what I said was it wouldn't surprise me to find that Brock can work stiff, not that he necessarily does. But, but thanks. That was I, last I one. introduced, that was the last one? Yes, indeed. Sweet. Oh. Uh, by, by the way, Raven, I introduced Arden to some, some classic wrestling stuff that um, was around before she was born. Um, some early tables, ladders, and chairs, and hell in the cell, and stuff like that. Um, only, only the really, really good stuff. But thank you so much for that. Dave. Yes. Where on earth should people expect to see you next? Well, if you want to see me live in person, come to Washington, D.C., uh, look online. You, you could actually look. Yeah, I don't think I've got the. I'll have I'll be posting on my platforms exactly where it is, a link to the conference. It's this summit for religious freedom. And I'm going to be doing a talk called How to Live and Die Out Loud. And then I'll be in Denver at the American Humanist Conference. I mentioned all this before. And then in, on, on the interwebs, you'll be able to see me right on this very channel coming up starting May 16th every Tuesday night, except the times I'll be out of town or whatever, and they'll cover for me, Jimmy will. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to that show, and um, can't wait for some good conversations, some good co-hosts, and so on. Awesome. So, yeah, keep your eyes open for all that. I know I went through the list already twice today, but I'm going to do it again. And that is tomorrow on Transatlantic call and Show. It's uh, Arden and Katie. Um, Jimmy's going to do it because I want to whenever he wants to because that's what he gets to do. Sunday show is Jimmy Snow and Forrest Valkai, as I will be in Florida. Um, Skep Talk is Aaron Ra and Brian Dalton. And Tuesday, Hostility is going to be with Jimmy Snow and Seth Andrews. And please tune back in uh, on May 16th for Dying Out Loud. Keep your eyes out for the other new shows that are also coming to the line. Um, I I just want to say a huge thank you again to our moderators, call screeners, and everybody else who's who's helping build this up. Um, we're at eighty three thousand subscribers today, which is I think fifty thousand more than when I first got involved, or something like that. Um, it's I understand not everybody is going to get it and I'm not always going to get it right or be right or do it right. But there are ways to have these conversations and there are ways to have them be productive, even if it doesn't always seem that way at the beginning and much in the way uh, the, the question was asked um, about hey, how would you tell the difference between dishonest or misunderstanding? It's a great question. Because in the heat of the moment, I can get it wrong. We all can. Matter of fact, I might be more likely to get it wrong, but I might also be more likely to get it right. I don't know. I don't know what the data show. Um, and it looks like we got 
you got another super chat that just came in mm -hmm. on my screen from skeptics and scoundrels thanks for another fine show it's always good to see dave as guest host that's true i agree jimmy i know a bank and a print and we can rob will be quidnappers nice uh <laughs> lily pat la i recently seriously dated a polyamorous atheist and struggle with the overt sexuality of the atheist community and advice for bridging that gap uh 1999 thanks lily pad um i don't know what you mean by the overt sexuality of the atheist community mm -mm, uh, neither. Are are you are you saying that the atheist community generally is more open about talking about sex stuff? Because if that's what you're talking about, uh, then we're going to be expanding the line to also the line X um, with shows on sex and other stuff as well. Um, but I don't. I think I maybe don't know. I, the, I, the, you know, if, if we're coming from a, especially if we're coming from a Christian. Uh, framework or background where everything was hush hush about sex and everything was repressed then yeah people are going to be more open about talking about these things but i don't know if there's a sexuality that is overt i haven't experienced it myself um in terms of anything that's um you know uh, assault i mean there's assault and stuff happens unfortunately but i don't i don't see it as a a problem in the atheist community, quote unquote. Um, that's not I, I want to make sure I understand this. I tell you what, Lilypad, uh, because this is coming in late and we we've got to wrap up and everything else. Um, maybe call in uh, and explain exactly what you're talking about, and I might have thoughts yeah. on it because uh, yeah, be I don't want to I don't want to misrepresent what you're talking about. But I, I greatly sure. appreciate it. The, the one bit of advice I'll give you is you don't owe anybody an explanation for you, who you are, or what that's you right. like, what you don't like. And you are not required to participate or be in a conversation that makes you uncomfortable. And if you're in a big group 100%. of people and they're all talking about something that you're uncomfortable with, you might have to excuse yourself because they're going to get to talk about what they want. But if it's a smaller uh, conversation, you can just say, I'm not comfortable being involved mm -hmm. in this conversation. Can we talk about something else? And if they want to continue, then you excuse yourself. And most people, I think, mm -hmm. will be like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's talk about uh something else but ah uh, anyway yeah all right i gotta go pee <laughs> you gotta go pee and i don't I know do. if there's another one after that nope that's it okay I cool think that's it yeah. then let me wrap it up with this you can find more um at i am dying out loud dot org um and keep your eyes out here on the channel you'll be seeing dave more You'll be seeing all of us more. A huge thank you to Jimmy and our call screeners and our moderator. Um, yes. You guys have made my Wednesday, once again, better and and a lot better. And I mean that, and I know people aren't always going to grasp this. I mean that not just for the contributions and the chat and the people who are, are going to agree or say, oh, Matt, you were awesome when I wasn't, um, but genuinely, or the callers that I disagree with. Um, I have to move on at some point, and I know it gets heated and whatever else, but I genuinely appreciate the fact that we had whatever conversation we wound up having, because all of us, you, me, and the people watching, should be able to learn something, even if it's, I don't know if that's the right way, but it's a way, and maybe mm -hmm. I like that, maybe I don't. At the end of the day, though, all any of us can do is try our best to do our best to make the world better for all of us. And for some people, that means no conflict. And for other people, it's the conflict that pushes us towards resolving something. In any 100%. case, my Wednesday is much better. My life in general is much better. Dave has to pee. So we'll see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. This is where you can pretend to keep doing stuff like you're wrapping up like on a news show. It, it'll it'll move over you and then you'll see like a, yeah, yeah it's, it's a it's a pristine dance we do here